objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. Before we begin today's hearing, I want to remind members of a few matters, including some required by the regulations accompanying House Resolution 965, which established a framework for remote committee proceedings. First, I would ask all members on the WebEx platform to keep themselves muted when they are not being recognized. This will minimize disturbances while members are asking questions of our witnesses. Members on the WebEx platform are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves. The staff have been instructed not to mute members except where a member is not being recognized and there is inadvertent background noise. Members on the WebEx platform are reminded that they may only attend one remote hearing at a time. So if you are participating today, please remain with us during the hearing. Members should try to avoid coming in and out of the meeting, particularly during the question period. If during the hearing, members wish to be recognized, the chair recommends that members identify themselves by name so as to facilitate the chair's recognition. I would also ask that members be patient as the chair proceeds, given the nature of the online platform the committee is using. In addition, the chair informs the members participating in person that in enforcing order and decorum in the hearing room, the chair has a duty to protect the safety of members. The attending physician provided the following guidance. <clears throat> For U.S. House of Representatives meeting in a limited enclosed period, a space such as a committee hearing room for greater than 15 minutes, face coverings are required. Accordingly, the chair will treat wearing masks as a matter of order and decorum, and all members should wear masks. The chair has a strong preference for members to wear masks even while recognized. Members who do not wish to wear masks may participate virtually through the WebEx platform. Today's hearing is entitled protecting consumers during the pandemic, an examination of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. I will now recognize myself for five minutes to give an opening statement. I would like to welcome Director Kranger uh, to what I hope will be her last appearance before this committee as CFPB Director. 10 years after we passed the Dodd-Frank Act to end the predatory and discriminatory practices that caused the financial crisis, we find ourselves in the midst of an economic and health crisis caused by incompetence and exacerbated by narcissism. That will once again hit the most vulnerable Americans the hardest. The scale of the crisis is unprecedented. Today, we learned from the Bureau of Economic Analysis that the gross domestic product, that is the GDP, decreased at an annual rate of 32.9% in the second quarter of 2020, which is the largest drop ever recorded. Our consumers need a strong consumer bureau that provides robust protections on their behalf and holds financial institutions accountable when they commit abuses. A record number of people have filed complaints about financial institutions with the CFPB during the COVID-19 crisis. We know that consumers are reporting major hardships in working with payday lenders, mortgage services, credit card companies, and the credit reporting bureaus. They're reporting long wait times, inconsistent information from consumer representatives, and a lack of follow-up. Unfortunately, I witnessed today consumer Bureau Director Kathy Kraninger has done nothing, next to nothing, of substance about any of this. Instead, she has focused the Consumer Bureau on weakening critical consumer protections, relaxing enforcement against financial institutions, and undermining the agency from the inside. Director Kraninger, let's review some of the harmful actions you have taken since March when the pandemic began. You issued a final rule rolling back key safeguards for payday, car title, and installment loans, exposing consumers to high cost predatory loans. It is shameful to open the floodgates to predatory loan products that trap consumers in a cycle of debt at any time. But to do so during a pandemic is egregious. It is hands down the most anti consumer action you have taken as director, and given your record, that's saying a lot. You also weakened the reporting requirements 
under the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, willfully hindering the ability of the Consumer Bureau researchers, journalists, advocates, and the public to detect redlining and patterns of discrimination in mortgage lending. An investigation by Revell News found evidence of modern day redlining in 61 metropolitan areas across the country. Using the public data set, you are now degrading. It is deeply irresponsible and malicious to undermine this important tool. In addition, you have issued an advance notice of proposed rulemaking to make substantial changes to the agency's qualified mortgage rule, which is a rule implementing the standard that lenders first demonstrate that a borrower can repay a loan before signing the mortgage document. It is unfortunately all too fitting that you seek to undermine the standard on the 10-year anniversary of Dodd-Frank. You may not remember the financial crisis, but I and the members of this committee do. We included this standard in Dodd-Frank because the proliferation of unaffordable and predatory mortgage loans was a central driver of the 2008 financial crisis and caused millions of families and especially borrowers of color to unfairly lose their homes. These actions are just the latest that you have carried out to sabotage the very agency you have been entrusted with leading. Your actions are a betrayal of the consumers you are asked with protecting consumers better. And so, having said that, uh, I'm a little bit disturbed that I'm missing uh, the uh, television portrayal of the funeral of John Lewis with magnificent speakers there today. Uh, but, you know, we have to carry on with the business, and I now recognize the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry, for five minutes for an opening statement. Um, well, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I would say the majority schedules the timing of these hearings. Um, but. The, the, the partisan nature of the, the chair's opening uh, comments, I think, um, belie the, the broad unseriousness of our current politics in the midst of this pandemic, sadly. But Madam Chair, I, I wanna welcome Director Kraninger for the first of what I hope are many appearances before the committee in the coming years. Uh, if, I, if, if I were not wearing a mask, you'd see that I say that with a smile and uh, an attempt to be lighthearted in the midst of what is a pretty disastrous political discussion we're having here in Washington. So look, uh, committee Democrats are asking questions. The CFPB protecting consumers both during and outside of the pandemic. And if you look at the facts in a fair-minded way and recent actions by the Bureau, I can uh, safely answer my colleagues' questions. Yes, yes they are. Despite the Demo what the Democrats say to score political points, this CFPB, under your leadership, Director Kraninger, has worked diligently to provide resources, guidance, and protection for consumers most at risk in these unsettling times. The Bureau has encouraged financial institutions to work with borrowers, provide increased flexibility for supervision and enforcement activities, clarify guidance to mortgage servicers to comply with CARES Act forbearance requirements, create an elder fraud prevention response network uh, development guide, release an uh, updated COVID-19 consumer complaint data bulletin, outlined the roles and responsibilities of credit reporting companies and furnishers, created a consumer relief guide for mortgage payment, forbearance, and foreclosure protection. Pretty damn good work, I must say. And at the same time, keeping your workforce safe. These are just a few of the CFPB's uh, pandemic-related initiatives. Apart from its response to the pandemic, this bureau under your leadership has approached difficult and polarizing topics with a steady hand over the last year and a half. And I wanna thank you for that. You've increased clarity in the market for consumer lending. One example is the Bureau's recent rulemaking to revise the 2017 small dollar lending rule. We know that small dollar loans are a lifeline for millions of Americans in need. They help consumers cover unexpected expenses or income shortfalls during periods of economic stress like we're currently experiencing now. The decision to revise that 2017 rule is a necessary step to increase clarity and access in a market that serves millions of Americans trying to make ends meet. We must continue to review and right-size burdensome regulations that inhibit lending into the real economy at a time when the American people need it most and can, uh, it can least afford uh, that inhibited lending. Lastly, Director Kraninger, as we've discussed in the past, my colleagues and I believe 
uh, you have too much power. The structure of the Bureau is unchecked by Congress and the President, and even, uh, even you know, even, uh, and you even agree with, with me on that, consistently before your confirmation, after your confirmation. And since Dodd-Frank's enactment, Republicans have argued the Bureau's structure is unconstitutional, the funding mechanism leaves it unaccountable to anyone. This past June, the Supreme Court agreed with what Republicans have been saying all along. In striking down the structure created by the Democrats in 2010, the Supreme Court found the director holds too much power and violates the separation of powers. We now have a real opportunity to work together on necessary statutory reforms to the Bureau, reforms that will benefit consumers and bring clarity and clear guidance. Uh, leader in that effort is my colleague and friend, Blaine Lukemeyer. And Director Craner, I want to thank you for your leadership and want to yield the balance of my time uh, to uh, fellow ranking member Lukemeyer. Uh, thank you, ranking member, and thank you, Director Kaniger, for being here today. Just a few weeks ago, the Supreme Court confirmed the unconstitutional structure of the CPB by ruling the CPB director can be fired at will by the President of the United States. Structure and unprecedented authority of the CPB have turned it into a political football that will no doubt swing back and forth on the political pendulum, creating uncertainty and confusion for financial institutions and consumers for decades to come. That's why I've introduced legislation to change the leadership structure of the CFPB from a single director that can be fired at will to a bipartisan five-member commission. This last Congress, this legislation enjoyed bipartisan support in this committee. However, in the 116th Congress, this common sense solution has only garnered support from my side of the aisle. Changing leadership structure and increasing government oversight of the CFPB are vital to protect businesses and consumers I look forward to discussing these issues with you today. With that, Madam Chair, I yield back. It is now time uh, to hear from Director Kathy Kraninger. Director Kraninger has testified before the committee previously and I believe uh, needs no further introduction. Without objection, your written testimony will be made part of the record. You will have five minutes to summarize your testimony. When you have one minute remaining, a yellow light will appear. At that time, I would ask you to wrap up your testimony so we can be respectful of the committee members' time. You are now recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to provide you with an update of the fantastic work the CFPB has been doing since last we met. I appear before you as the country is engaged in a national conversation on racial inequality and confronting the unprecedented pandemic. Today, I'd like to discuss both of these topics with you. Under my leadership, the CFPB is taking steps to help create real and sustainable changes in our financial system so that African Americans and other minorities have equal opportunities to build wealth and close the economic divide. Earlier this week, I authored a blog outlining the Bureau's important fair lending work. We also issued a request for information on how best to create a regulatory environment that prevents credit discrimination in all aspects of the transaction and expands access to credit. The information that is submitted will help us enforce the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, or ECOA. Among the topics the public can comment on are how to better protect consumers with limited English proficiency, as well as applicants who derive income from any public assistance program. I encourage the public to respond so that we can build a financial system that treats everyone fairly and provides clear rules of the road. Having clear standards helps us identify any violations in fair lending laws. Recently, the Bureau filed a lawsuit alleging a lender had violated ECOA by discouraging African Americans from applying for loans through its advertising. The Bureau also announced a settlement last year with a mortgage corporation that violated the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act and Regulation C by intentionally submitting years of mortgage loan data that contained errors in the fields of race, ethnicity, and sex. Since my last testimony before the committee, I have requested critical authority from Congress to allow the Bureau to compensate whistleblowers. In our enforcement work, we have seen firsthand that whistleblowers can provide key information on fair lending violations. I want to thank Congressman Green for introducing legislation similar to what I requested. I stand ready to work with Congress to secure this important authority. Now let me take a moment to discuss how we are protecting consumers during the pandemic. 
We have worked to expand our reach to consumers to provide them with actionable, useful information about their rights, options, and expectations in the market for consumer financial products and services. We have produced over 70 blogs and videos that have been ac accessed directly by more than 3 million users. Through our social media reach, staff estimates our materials have been sent to 41 million unique users. These materials are available in seven different languages and have been constantly updated to adapt to the changing dynamics. We have also promoted our consumer complaint system. When consumers submit complaints to the Bureau, they help inform our work in supervision, enforcement, regulation, and, and education. Specifically in response to complaints and other markets and stakeholder feedback, we worked with interagency partners to quickly address a student loan related credit reporting issue as well as CARES Act's mortgage forbearance lump sum payment concerns. From January 1st through July 26, 2020, consumers have submitted more than 270,000 complaints to the Bureau, of which more than 14,000 complaints specifically reference coronavirus. Each month from March through June set a new monthly record for complaints. Our Consumer Contact Center and our online portal have operated efficiently and effectively throughout the pandemic to take those consumer complaints and refer them to companies for response and ensure those responses are received. We also partnered with other federal agencies to develop and launch a unified housing website to provide consumers with comprehensive and accurate information on their rights during this time. The Bureau has also developed a new targeted supervisory approach called prioritized assessment to focus on those markets and institutions that pose the greatest risk of consumer harm as a result of pandemic-related issues. We remain fully engaged in the execution of the Bureau's critical mission, including continued progress on our regulatory agenda, which is relevant to the pandemic and ultimate economic recovery, as well as our supervisory and enforcement work. We work closely with partners and stakeholders, recognizing the important roles that others play in supporting our consumer protection mission and preventing harm. I am particularly proud of the Bureau staff's excellent work during these, un these challenging and unprecedented times. And thank you again for allowing me the opportunity to testify today. I look forward to the questions. Thank you very much. I now recognize myself for five minutes for questions. Director Kroninger, under your leadership, the Consumer Bureau has brought fewer fair lending enforcement actions, rolled back consumer protections, against predatory uh, payday lending, scale back HMDA data used to combat discriminatory practices like redlining and engage in inappropriate personnel practices, such as allowing political appointees like Thomas Ward to borrow into the agency and take what should be a nonpartisan career position and hiring Eric Blankenstein, who is well-documented racist, views and Paul Watkins, who was affiliated with an anti-LGBTQ hate group. Director Kroninger, following the financial crisis more than a decade ago, Congress determined that consumers needed an agency solely dedicated to protecting them from the abusive practices and products that contributed to the crisis. When Congress passed Dodd-Frank and created the Consumer Bureau, we clarified the rules of the road and asked the agency with enforcing the law, task rather the agency, with enforcing the law and protecting consumers in the financial marketplace. The pandemic has only heightened the need for the Consumer Bureau to protect struggling consumers. Unfortunately, the Consumer Bureau has engaged in deregulation without facts or reasoning and seems to be protecting the interests of industry or the interests of consumers. Director Kraninger, what proactive supervisory and enforcement steps has the Consumer Bureau taken to protect consumers who have lost income due to COVID-19 and are struggling through no fault of their own? How are you utilizing the authorities at the Consumer Bureau's disposal to protect consumers against bad actors that have taken advantage of our communities during this crisis? What have you done? Chairwoman, our supervisory and enforcement work continues through the pandemic. I'll say briefly about supervisory actions because I think it's a very different approach than we've had. Typically, examiners go back, go to an institution and look at loan files from two years ago and assess compliance against the law, which is important. 
We instituted, as a result of the pandemic, a prioritized assessment process. We are going to hundreds of institutions across the spectrum and a risk-based approach to look at what they are doing with respect to the pandemic. What are their operational challenges? Are they following the guidance to accommodate their customers? Are they following the CARES Act processes? Are they providing clear information to consumers? And we are looking to, again, prevent consumer harm by addressing that right at the issue and right at the point where that activity Director happens. Kaninger, after you do all of those reviews and ask those questions, then what do you do? Chairwoman, if we find violations, we will act on them. But I will say that the vast majority- Give us an example of one of those corrections you have taken. I'm sorry, Chairwoman, I didn't understand that. After you have done your reviews, making sure that people are doing what they're supposed to do, when you find that they have not been doing it, what do you do and give us an example of one that you have taken care of? Well, it's, it, that is a confidential process through the examination, but we do get restitution for consumers through supervision. There's a bunch of examples in the semi-annual report of the amount of uh, restitution that's been gotten through supervision. We also, uh, certainly if we believe there are bad actors or if this is a sustained issue uh, with respect to violations, that's referred to enforcement. We also independently take in enforcement actions. And in the pandemic, we have been incredibly active with all of our law enforcement party, uh, partners, from state attorneys general to the Justice Department and the FTC. In Director Kraninger, are those enforcement actions that you have taken available to members of this Congress? Can we see, can we see what you have documented that you have done when you have done your reviews and discovered uh, that you have people in departments that are not doing what they're supposed to do? do can we review what you have done? Uh, yes, Chairwoman. Uh, well, thank you. Let the record you. indicate that the Chairwoman is interested in reviewing actions taken by the Director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau after she has done reviews or where she has determined that those who have not been following the rules, the laws, the procedures, et cetera, uh, we can understand exactly what she has done. So also, while I have a few minutes here, Consumer complaints during the COVID-19 period have surged. Nearly half of all complaints, 46%, were related to credit reporting. Nevertheless, in April, the Consumer Bureau announced that it would allow much greater flexibility in how, credit, how long credit reporting agencies may take to investigate consumer report disputes. Do you think it is appropriate for the Consumer Bureau to announce that it would weaken enforcement of the credit, Fair Credit Reporting Act requirement? that credit reporting agencies like Equifax investigate disputes in a timely fashion? My time is up. You do not have time to answer that. I will submit that question and answer, uh, and uh, uh, will submit it to you uh, for further uh, answers. The gentleman from North Carolina, Ranking Member, Mr. McHenry, is recognized for five minutes. Um, well, thank you, Director Craniger, for being here, uh, and thank you for uh, Managing this process, I know it's awkward to sit, to speak with a mask on and to sit behind a, effectively a salad guard or whatever those things are that you're behind. Uh, but we're trying to do our best. And there are a couple uh, broad things I want to uh, talk about. Obviously, the Supreme Court decision, um, which is something I brought up in my opening statement. You consistently said you believed um, that the director is given too much power. The Congress should remedy this. Um, and I appreciate the fact that you continue to have that same view, even though you have this enormous power and the sort of lax accountability uh, standards as well. Um, has your view of your role shifted since the Supreme, the Supreme Court decision? Uh, Congressman, certainly we reviewed the case. I was, I was very gratified that the Supreme Court took up that case and, and made the decision on it. It's created a lot of uncertainty in the agency's enforcement actions and around the agency's uh, mission. And I think that uh, is incredibly helpful to the process. I will say with respect to additional changes on structure or otherwise, I, I leave those in the hands of Congress to the extent that you all decide to make changes on that and, and that law uh, becomes law, we will certainly work to um, institute those changes. I also mentioned a small dollar uh, lending rule. Um, there are details of this that I agree with. There are details of it that I disagree with. Uh, but uh, why did you take the action on small dollar, uh, the small dollar lending rule? 
So, Congressman, uh, there was a lot of concern. Frankly, we were in litigation over that rulemaking. There was a lot of concern about the dramatic impact it would have on the small, the availability of small dollar credit. Uh, we know there is significant demand and need uh, and interest in small dollar credit. That's been documented, and Congress has even taken actions funding a small dollar uh, program uh, mm -hmm. through CDFIs. So trying to promote competition in that space is an important aspect of it. And there were a lot of issues with respect to the payday rule that were undermining that. Uh, most pointedly, though, we followed the Administrative Procedures Act and noted uh, and documented that the initial rule did not have the robust evidence and legal basis given that dramatic impact on small dollar credit availability. So there's benefit in terms of credit availability and benefits for certainty, right? Uh, regulatory certainty. Um, and so that will have a positive impact for consumers and their access. Uh, will you continue to ensure that there's diligent oversight of the industry? Absolutely. Uh, our enforcement actions have continued uh, apace uh, in this industry as in others. We know there are bad actors in every market. And so we will continue to enforce the law and engage in examinations of payday lenders, which we have done. Um, but in addition to that, we're doing work on disclosure testing to ensure that consumers do understand this product. There's a lot of evidence that they understand it, but let's actually uh, continue to do the disclosure testing as well. So a lot of different aspects of this. So, Director uh, Craniger, uh, I, I want to thank you for uh, reviewing Section 1033 of Dodd-Frank, uh, reaching out to the industry uh, industries about this um, and consumers. Um, and uh, that section focuses on consumers' ability to access their financial information. I, I know Congress, we, we want to do our work for data privacy for our jurisdiction. I think there is consensus between um, all parties on, on the need, and then we can dial down in terms of, of changes. But uh, this statutory requirement um, is, is, is interesting in light of the massive change that's happening in banking. Uh, and the feedback you've gotten. For example, fintech companies offer improved personal financial management, faster loan underwriting, and better payment services. Uh, and those are positive developments. They are. Um, and I want to make sure that we continue to foster that exact sort of uh, innovation. Is that the reason why you're undertaking this? What, what are the benefits for for a review of the regulatory framework. No, I, that is that is certainly one uh, key priority and principle of, of the activity is continuing to promote innovation in this space. Uh, and we had a symposium uh, just a few months ago to talk through this issue and bring experts together. It was truly a robust conversation. Uh, the the uh, agency has allowed the industry and all stakeholders and the public to continue to take advantage of those innovations in the marketplace. But we're at the point now where we really should examine the way in which that data transmission occurs, and that's why we're moving to an advance notice of proposed well, rulemaking. And let me close by saying thank you. Uh, you've been a good public servant, uh, and you continue to uh, act in accordance with the law and have been open to feedback, and I appreciate that. Um, very much appreciate it. Uh, Madam Chair, I ask unanimous consent to insert into the record two letters. The first is a July letter to the uh, uh, to the Financial Services Committee from the Consumer Bankers Association articulating a number of thoughts on the CFPB's rulemaking and actions. And the second letter is a July letter from the Association of Credit and Collection Professionals opining on the CFPB's rulemaking as it relates to the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. Without objection, such is the order. Thank you, Madam Chair. Gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Velasquez, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman and Ranking Member, for having this important hearing, especially at this time. Uh, Director Kroninger, earlier this month, the CFPB finalized its revision to the pay late, payday lending rule, stripping out a key provision of the original rule developed by that Dr. Cordray, the ability to repay requirement. Do you believe the Bureau's revised rule will leave low-income borrowers and those of color more or less protected from unscrupulous payday lenders during this pandemic? Congresswoman, the mandatory underwriting provisions were having the impact of uh, a substantial reduction in the availability of small dollar credit for all communities and particularly uh, the communities you mentioned and vulnerable communities who are really in need of 
access to responsible products for small dollar loans. And that was the primary consideration. The protections continue with respect to the payments provision. I hear you. I disagree with you in terms of uh, access to credit. Basically, you know, the smaller of the financial institutions are the ones that are providing um, uh, loans to uh, individuals and small businesses. Not that. So, how how would you respond to? The president of the Center for Responsible Lending, Mike Calhoun, who said that the pain caused by the CSPB got in the payday rule will be felt most by those who can least afford it, including communities of color who are disproportionately targeted by payday lenders. Congresswoman, the availability of credit had, and that rulemaking did have a broader impact. Uh, the number of banks that are issuing small dollar products was substantially limited. There are a number so of reasons and factors you, for You're that. saying that uh, Mr. Cahoon is wrong, that you're right. Uh, D Director Penninger, a review of the CSPB's consumer complaint database shows that consumer complaints have risen dramatically in the start of the pandemic. However, CSPB rules still allow companies up to 60 days to respond to a consumer complaint. Given the rising number of complaints and the economic uncertainty many individuals and households are facing, why has the CSPB not sought to shorten this response time? Congresswoman, I should off the top of my head have the average response time, but it is substantially shorter than that. Uh, I believe we're basically at a week for most turnarounds. The 60-day allowance is really because some of these are more complicated issues in terms of what the complaint is and making sure it is addressed. So I think we have a fantastic record of actually getting a meaningful response. But why not the shorten the 60-day requirement or the 60 days uh, timeline? Given the fact that we are consumers are suffering in this country, these are people that are in trouble right now. Why can you not shorten the 60 days? Uh, Congressman, the vast majority, we'll get back to you in an actual. It number, would be great to have so some empathy. Time. Director Kreninger, mortgage related concerns represented the highest percentage of COVID related complaints received by the Bureau. Earlier this month, we held an oversight hearing in which we learned that some mortgage servicers are failing to notify borrowers of their right to forbearance under the CHAOS Act. Is the CFPB concerned that some servicers are failing to accurately represent borrowers' rights under the CARES Act? How is the CFPB working to address this issue? So we have produced uh, a significant amount of material in co cooperation with HUD and FHFA, scripts for servicers, so they have very clear messages that they are supposed to provide to their customers. We've done videos for customers, and in fact, many of the servicers are pulling the information off the CFPB's website and sending it to their customers. In multiple languages, this is all available. Do you um, have any data as to any complaints coming from uh, uh, individuals the who complaint, feel that they are not, their rights have not been uh, protected? There were complaints uh, right around CARES Act passage about concerns about being able to pay their mortgages and concerns about the messages that they were getting. Uh, we acted expeditiously, really, those March-April complaints and addressed them um, through a lot of different actions, and they have gone down substantially since that time. We're certainly still monitoring, and if we see an increase or if we see any bad action, um, working really closely with FHFA, actually, we're looking at all of this and we're acting. Thank you. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Missouri, Ms. Wagner, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and uh, welcome back, Director Hanniger. I, I want to just first thank you for your service to our country and uh, for your service to all the consumers in Missouri's second congressional district. I appreciate your leadership uh, now, and I look forward to it 
uh, in the future. Before I begin my questions, I, I also wanted to, to thank you for all the work that you have done to not uh, only increase transparency at the CFPB, but also streamline and tailor regulations to better protect and provide, I think, clarity for consumers and the private sector. So thank you for that. While I'm proud of your efforts to increase transparency and accountability, uh, the CFPB issues regarding its structure go beyond that of any one director. Now that the Supreme Court has made its decision regarding the structure of the Bureau, uh, it is time, time for Congress to work together to put the Bureau uh, on a budget overseen by Congress and to run uh, by a bipartisan board. Director Kraninger, would you please discuss how the credit reporting provisions in the CARES Act are working to protect consumers who have been impacted by COVID-19. And that is a, a very important issue. And I think we're in a much better position than we were after the financial crisis in recognizing the importance of the credit reporting system and our ability to act very quickly on issues as, as they occur and address them so that they don't impact consumers. The CARES Act provision, of course, requires that uh, those who are affected by the pandemic be reported as current when they're in a, a forbearance um, program under the CARES Act. And that is something that we are monitoring. I mentioned earlier the prioritized assessments. That includes a constant presence that the CFPB has with the national credit reporting agencies. We are looking at specifically what they're doing with the information that comes in. We're also doing uh, examinations of furnishers on the other side to make sure they're reporting the right way. Uh, of course, current is not the only thing that is in the data that gets transmitted by the furnishers. So there are uh, a lot of different details about how precisely you continue to comply with FICRA in terms of accuracy and otherwise. Mm -hmm. uh, but we are all working very closely together to keep that um, intent of Congress uh, implemented. Uh, recently, the Bureau announced that it would be issuing an adv advance notice, I believe is what it's called, an advance notice of proposed rulemaking regarding consumer authorized access to financial records. How does the Bureau intend to address privacy and security concerns in an environment where many unregulated or un underregulated companies are eager to, uh, as we know, obtain and resell consumers' financial data? So Section 1033 is, is, of course, what you're referencing, and Congress um, anticipated there might be a need for rulemaking. We're still at looking at that. Uh, the primary driver is that consumers should be the ones who authorize the data use. But to your point, privacy and security issues are, are uh, intertwined with that and incredibly important. The means by which many of the data aggregators have been uh, accessing that data is by consumers providing their uh, banking credentials. And that, of course, means then the entity can go in and screen scrape the data and take it out. Uh, that has caused a lot of concern by those who mm -hmm. uh, believe they're stewards of that data. So we have a lot of uh, data, um, technical data access issues there um, with respect to how that happens. And it will be, a, 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 we have not pre-decided you know, pre there needs to be a rule but it will be a challenging rulemaking to take precisely the privacy, security, uh, make it lasting so that it doesn't change based on technology changes as well. Uh, but we're really looking to, to do that right. I think so too. Um, how will the Bureau ensure that the path towards enhanced data portability does not lead to consumer exploitation or a, an uneven playing field between deposit holding institutions and potentially under-regulated FinTech companies. I've got concerns about that too uh, as you move forward. Yes, no, I, you're, you're outlining precisely the, the challenge here. Again, we, the consumer is front and center in Section 1033, um, but there also needs to be information to that consumer about what they might be opening up. Great, thank you. My time's expired and I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from California, Mr. Sherman, who is also the chair for the Subcommittee on Investor Protection, Entrepreneurship and Capital Markets is now recognized for five minutes. 
Five quick, easy questions. Pace loans. Congress passed a law in 2018 requiring regulations, including ability to repay. March 2019, you issued a proposed rule. October uh, 2019 and February 2020, I had a chance to ask you about the status. Um, we need to protect consumers. When do we get the regulations? Congressman, uh, the answer I gave you, I can give you a slightly better answer than I did in February. The data collection that we need to predicate that notice of proposed rulemaking will begin in September, early September. It was a, it was a paperwork reduction act requirement that does take significant amount of time. Uh, but by okay. early September, that data collection will happen. So the, we'll the, have the data this year. So the work you promised in February will start in September. Nick, uh, I'll follow you to be as quickly as quick as possible on that. Understood. Uh, consumer credit scores. People lose their jobs because of COVID. They have negative, uh, uh, they're unable to pay this or that bill. Does that a fair entry on their credit report and a good predictor of how well they'll be able to pay their bills once the crisis is over? Congressman, Shouldn't we prevent these negative items during the COVID crisis from being on the credit report? I know you're asking a critically important question that you and Congress are actually thinking about and looking at now. You could solve Congress the problem for us, you know. You could simply prohibit, I hope you will look at pro preventing these negative items from being on the credit report. But one particular area where Congress has acted, the CARES Act said that mortgage forbearance is allowed to homeowners and prohibits negative credit reporting from, uh, uh, from, that, from using that forbearance. But FHFA charges premiums on mortgages to borrowers who have accessed the forbearance. Uh, which means that that is being reported and it's, res and it's disadvantaging the homeowner. What can you do to make sure that the forbearance that the CARES Act uh, indicates should not be on the credit report is not reported in a way that causes FHFA to raise the premiums? I, I can't speak to the premium aspect, Congressman, but I can in the overall context of this. We, we are working very closely with the NCRAs and with the furnishers to understand, you know, what else they're Can reporting. Can you call the folks over at FHFA and say, hey, it's my job to make sure you don't get this information on the credit report, so where are you getting it? We will talk about this because you're the first person to mention the premium issue, so I, I will go back and look at that, and we'll certainly get back to you on what the, okay. what the decision is there. The, ne the next issue is Facebook. The entities you regulate are supposed to make sure they don't discriminate uh, based on age, gender, race, et cetera. Facebook has this complicated algorithm. So when you buy an ad on Facebook, you don't quite know who you're reaching. Uh, Facebook probably isn't going to reveal its algorithms, but if a, one of the entities being regulated by your agency gets a certification from Facebook saying you have opted for a ad campaign that we are making sure does not discriminate against the, the people you're not supposed to discriminate against, would that be adequate? Or do the entities that you regulate have to not be on Facebook unless Facebook uh, reveals their algorithm? There, there are a lot of facts and circumstances behind, uh, obviously, the premise of your question. And I wouldn't want to answer that in this unique case. I would tell you overall that we do, we do engage in fair lending examinations of the institutions. Uh, that certainly includes looking at their advertising. And uh, beyond that, I, I can't get into too much more depth here. But we well, I hope you would look at the like specific. Back in the old days, you'd put an ad in the newspaper, and that'd be the, their way each town had one big newspaper. Now you have so many different choices. Uh, when you advertise with Facebook, it's one big entity, but you got thousands of different advertising campaigns you can ask for. And I would assume that you would create a circumstance where if you specify non-discrimination that it's on Facebook if they uh, uh, vi uh, violate that. One last thing is this, uh, these fintech companies that ask you to give them all the information so they can access your bank account, your brokerage statement. Uh, then they can sell the information they know about you. They're providing this free service at the cost of your privacy. Um, what is your perspective? What do we do to protect consumer privacy? Certainly starting with disclosure, I will say our, our, we have 
some limitations on our oversight of privacy, but I'll say on this point, we do have section 1033 to look at what the data aggregators are telling consumers in terms of the product, what they're getting from it. And so there is uh, there are a number of things that we're doing on that front in terms of disclosure and access. Thank you. The gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Lucas, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Director, can you detail the resources that CFPB has provided to consumers experiencing financial hardship during the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, certainly, we have uh, announced public enforcement. Uh, in terms of educational resources, I'll admit my mind went to money, but I'll say for educational resources I, extensive. We have issued over 70 blogs and videos, multiple languages, um, extensive information on um, how to manage your finances and think about them, uh, what questions to ask your servicers. As soon as the CARES Act was passed, we issued that video and that information within a week, uh, which was a significant accomplishment in moving mountains here to make sure we clearly, concisely told consumers what they were entitled to. And we've had millions of people watch that video in English and in Spanish and and that's something that I think we're particularly proud of in terms of, again, making sure consumers understand their rights. And I uh, commend the financial institutions and others, uh, consumer advocates, members of Congress, that are also sharing that very same uh, information with their uh, constituents and with their customers. It's important because many of our constituents have never faced the kind of challenges they're facing economically as a result of the pandemic, just as virtually no one alive has had to deal with this kind of a circumstance before. Continuing my line of questioning, you mentioned in your testimony that the Bureau will launch a website with HUD and FHFA for consumers to find accurate information about relief options. Could you outline what consumers should expect uh, when seeking out a forbearance or mortgage relief as provided in the CARES Act? Uh, yes, Congressman. So we have uh, that, that website is launched. It's got a lot of the resources I just talked about on it. Uh, consumers can expect that uh, they can contact their servicer and say, uh, I have experienced a hardship and therefore they are entitled to forbearance if that is a uh, either federally, a federally backed loan uh, or a GSE backed loan. So that is, uh, you know, clear to them. In addition, even those that are privately funded loans, they have the, uh, certainly they have direction from all of us as regulators to accommodate their customers. And many of them are also providing, you know, different kinds of forbearance, again, consistent with what their contractual obligations and abilities are. But the significant overwhelming number of institutions are providing uh, options to their customers. And the first step is having those customers contact them. The second is, come to us, the CFPB, if they have any issues or questions or complaints, and we are expeditiously addressing those. I very much appreciate that, Director. As I mentioned earlier, there are many of uh, my constituents, our constituents out there who are facing the kind of economic challenges they've never faced before, and this is a whole new terrifying experience to them. Terrifying. With that, Madam Chair, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. The gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Clay, who is also the chair for the Subcommittee on Housing, Community Development and Insurance is recognized for five minutes. We will move on. I think there's some technical difficulty. The gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver, who is also the chair for the Subcommittee on National Security, International Development and Monetary Policy is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I uh, appreciate very much uh, this um, uh, subject today with uh, uh, Director Kreninger uh, because I don't I, I don't know if there are very many other issues that that are uh, in the same area of importance. Um, I'm wearing my uh, protective gear because uh, someone was someone close to me has now. Uh, contracted the, the virus, and so I'm uh, trying to be as um, as protective of others as, as I can possibly be. Uh, Director Kreininger, um, I uh, I have a, a couple of questions, and I, I'll, I'll try to make them as clear as I can. Um, I think everybody's already mentioning how uh, things are difficult economically, and so 
I'm uh, uh, concerned about minority consumers who are frankly uh, hemorrhaging uh, right now and are uh, at heightened risk of uh, attack by financial predators. Um, you know, there, there's a, a saying that a, a sign, a, a, a blood in the water uh, is a sign that someone can be attacked, uh, especially because they are already uh, in a weak, weakened state. Uh, and that's the case right now. Last Friday, July 24th, the CDC released a report, and the first sentence read, and I quote, long-standing systemic health and social in inequities have put many people from racial and ethnic minority groups at increased risk of getting sick and dying from COVID-19. The, the, the uh, report goes on to uh, highlight discrimination as a primary factor in the heightened rate of death of minorities and especially noted housing and financial discrimination. And so we know that uh, access to emergency relief to help communities of color um, that are being uh, desperately impacted uh, is not being equitably, equitably distributed. A national online survey of 500 African Americans and Latinx owned small businesses conducted by the Global uh, Strategy Group uh, released a report. And, and they said after the second round of funding for the program was allocated, uh, they found that just 12% received full assistance uh, they requested, and two thirds reporting that they had not received any. Uh, and so if you go to the, the Center for Responsible Lending, 90% of businesses owned by people of color were shut out of the Paycheck Protection Program uh, and of the pending evictions, which were, which uh, economists have termed a tsunami, 40 million Americans may have been evicted. And so I, I think um, the, the first issue is, I, I, it would be helpful for me to find out uh, your belief as it relates to systemic race, racial discrimination. Uh, I mean, do you, uh, you uh, director, believe that it exists in this country? Uh, yes, Congressman, I, I know that it exists in this country, but it's abhorrent and it's certainly part of my duty uh, to root that out in the financial system. Yes, I, I, I agree with you and thank you. Uh, do, do you think that consumers of color uh, and women have been experiencing this uh, disparate uh, impact during the crisis? Uh, I mean, do you think they have been harmed by discrimination? Well, there, certainly the evidence that you stated does show that they're not starting in precisely the same place. And, and we have been doing everything we can to make sure that, and I'll say at the CFPB specifically, supporting our fellow federal agencies in trying to get the word out on economic impact payment uh, entitlements, on forbearance options to limited English proficiency groups, to African-American communities, um, and even on the Paycheck Protection Program, again, I've had significant outreach as well with um, communities of color to make sure that they have the information they need and, and can, can, we can increase access to these programs. Well, a couple of things. I'll try to uh, uh, be brief. My, my time is running out. But, you know, maybe uh, uh, you ought to restore the, the um, enforcement and supervisory authority of the Office of, of Fair Lending and, and Equal Opportunity. Uh, that might be, you know, an, an accurate or adequate response uh, to the problems we're having. What, what, what say you? I'm sorry, Congressman, I didn't, I didn't quite catch the last question. Have you considered restoring the, the, the supervisory and enforcement authorities of, of the office? Uh, I, I'm sorry, you're, you're asking about the supervisory and enforcement activities we are doing in fair lending, is that? Yeah, of the, uh, yes, of the, of the Office of, of Fair Lending and Equal Opportunity. Oh, yes. Well, well the Supervision Enforcement Fair Lending Division still engages very deeply in supervisory enforcement matters across the board, including fair lending. And we can get you some more information on that. I think my time is up. Thank you. Uh, thank you. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Posey, is recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chair, for calling this meeting and inviting this manager to be with us. You might be member as well. You know, for a number of years now, uh, I've tried to get CFPB to issue advisory opinions. And, uh, thank you very much, Director, for actually finally making that happen. It's a great asset. 
comply with the rules and regulations of the agency to know specifically uh, what they're asked to deal with. It's kind of eliminated so many problems plants you know, when you do that. As, as we mean to that, I believe our emphasis should be on the recovery of the economic woes that the virus has faced uh, us. And our hardworking Americans and their families. And, uh, regulation should not become a force that burdens society in the recovery before this vicious virus brought so much uh, suffering both in the nation's economy and to the police across the situation. President Trump's policies of reduced taxes and regulations uh, were finally bringing economy back from a long stagnation sluggishness that we suffered. That followed the Great Recession. By getting government off the backs of the hardworking people gave us the strongest economy in our history. Uh, there are important lessons to learn as we go forward. My first question for you, Mr. Penn, is uh, what your early experience was as an advisor of my pilot friend. I'm sorry, Congressman, you broke up a little bit on the question. So the, the experience with, with what specifically? Uh, the advisory opinion on pilot programs uh, implemented. Uh, so with the advisory opinion uh, program as we've launched, what, what has come in, I'm guessing you, you'd like to know? Yes, ma'am. Um, okay. So thank you, sir. Um, as you know, we're engaged right now in the pilot, and we're in a Paperwork Reduction Act process to get comments on the full program. We have not gotten anything in yet specifically, but it's only been you know a few weeks since we launched that. Uh, we do anticipate it, and as I told you, the biggest part about this is it's making formal and transparent interpretive rules that we've essentially been giving to individuals as they've asked along the way. So incredibly useful. Thank you. Um, many of us believe that the rules of regulation uh, must be applied with person to prevent overregulation and credit in such a way that uh, we put a tag on our growth, of course, the burden on families. Yeah. Uh, please tell us about your strategy to carry out the CFPB uh, without unduly constraining our economic uh, from this pandemic as we go forward. I'm sorry, Congressman, your sound is just cutting in and out, so it's hard to, to actually gather the question. I, I don't know why. Maybe, maybe the uh, lowest bit here is not the best bit for communications. Well, that I heard, of course. <laughs> what metrics and policy instruments will give you the to assure that we protect consumers but don't harm them? I have no idea. Uh, I'm sorry, sir. We're having a, a, a bit of technical difficulties, and I can't hear uh, Mr. Posey either. So we're going to come back to him. We're going to move on uh, now. We'll be back so that he can finish the uh, remainder of his time. Okay. With that, we'll start the clock over. Mr. Clay from Missouri, who is also the chair for the Subcommittee on Housing, Community Development, and Insurance, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and let me thank Director Craninger for her testimony today. And uh, Director Craninger, the CARES Act includes important foreclosure and forbearance protections for homeowners struggling to pay their mortgages. Given these protections, it is very concerning that 55% of COVID-19 related mortgage complaints identified struggling to pay the mortgage as the primary issue according to the most recent a bureau of bulletin consumers reported that some mortgage services are providing information that conflicts with guidance regarding lump sum paper um, what are you doing to ensure that mortgage services are compliant with the care act and thank you, Congressman. That's obviously a significant issue right now. The complaints uh, that you're referencing 
came in uh, very significantly, particularly in March and early April. So we actually looked carefully at those and we took a bunch of actions with FHFA and with HUD, including producing uh, scripts for servicers to make sure they are clearly conveying their CARES Act rights to the consumers who contact them. In addition, uh, we are, uh, with respect to the complaints, we noted that a lot of them came around what happened after the forbearance period. So we worked together and actually the CFPB issued an uh, interim final rule enabling servicers to offer uh, consumers a beneficial outcome, which is a lump sum payment at the end of the mortgage term, rather than having a question over when, what uh, loss mitigation options would be there. And under the mortgage servicing rules, the fact of the matter is that, that servicers would have to literally start uh, a full application process that was probably going to con confuse consumers. So we gave them this option. Uh, and acted very quickly with that in, in partnership with the other federal regulators. I, I can say we're, we're working very closely uh, on an ongoing basis to monitor those complaints, uh, to monitor what the servicers are concerned about or hearing, what consumer advocates are saying in terms of concerns they're hearing and housing counselors. Uh, and I will say it, it, it seems as though some those primary early issues have been addressed. We'll keep monitoring as, as things dynamically change. And so, uh... Last month, the Bureau released a proposed rule that would dr dramatically change the definition of qualified mortgage and we weaken consumer protection uh, by replacing the debt to income threshold with a standard based on a loan's pricing. Many consumer and industry groups have expressed concern with such a QM definition that only relies on the pricing of the loan and the broad Dodd Frank statutory product restriction, a definition that relies on price and reflects investors' assessment of risk, but does not assess an individual borrower's ability to repay. Uh, can you address that? Uh, gladly, Congressman. That's a critically uh, important, I think, misunderstanding. The Dodd Frank statutory requirements remain in effect. That includes consideration and verification of debt and income and that ability to repay. That is still very much a critical part of the process. The question is, in addition to that, how would you determine uh, what is a qualified mortgage and, and what is assumed to, to have that? And as we looked at the hard 43% debt to income ratio requirement, uh, there are many actually consumer organizations uh, and financial uh, institutions that have supported our approach is a pricing approach. It takes into account wider aspects about uh, the applicant and their credit worthiness, but it is not a replacement of consideration and verification of debt and income. That's in the statute and that, that continues. I, I guess as a final question, have you been able to prevent um, foreclosures of, of, of any uh, a great number? Or have, have you been able to uh, uh, air on the side of the of the homeowner to keep people in their homes. Is there any anecdotal or documentary evidence to that? Uh, Congressman, I, I certainly believe that Congress took the right action and, and I supported HUD and FHFA actually prior to the CARES Act when they put in place a foreclosure and eviction moratorium uh, on the properties that they, they back. Uh, critically important during that uncertain time, and, and I know it's something that you're all looking at again now. Well, thank you so much, and Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Lukemeyer, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> there we go. Thank you for being here today, uh, Ms. Craniger. Appreciate your testimony. And um, as you heard in my opening statement, I'm supportive of changing uh, and, and putting a commission in charge of the um, of CFPB. I was just curious as to your thoughts whether the commission, uh, if it's structured correctly, would be able to complete the mission of CFPB, and whether you thought it would stop it from being a political football, which we had another example of yet today in our opening statement. Uh, Congressman, I, I certainly would support things that would uh, take down the political temperature. I think you'll recall that that is something that I have talked about since 
even uh, my nomination. And that's certainly been my intent with the actions I've taken. Um, but I do think there are some inherent issues that are, are stacked against a single director in this, in this dynamic. In terms of the solutions to put into place, uh, I respectfully defer to Congress and, and what actions you all decide uh, to take there. And I would look forward to helping the agency transition to the extent that such changes are enacted. Uh, I think in response to Mrs. Wagner's uh, comments, concerns with regards to data and screen scraping and things like that, you articulated some concerns, indicated you're watching and looking at it and looking at trying to do some things. Could you articulate a few ideas that you've got with regards to how we can do certain things? I was a part of a, a group today that discussed this very issue of privacy. How do you protect? Where do you draw the line? Who owns the data? Um, you know, how much access should you allow? I mean, can you give us some just of your thoughts of directions you might be going on some of that stuff? Yes. Well, certainly we've been uh, talking extensively to all of the stakeholders who care about this, including the industry that are running uh, the technical back and forth of the data. Um, progress has been made at least to reduce screen scraping as the primary method. Uh, there are now uh, APIs that are agreed upon between entities that, that allows you to actually have a transmission of that data uh, in a more secure way. That doesn't mean the consumer needs to hand over their banking credentials to uh, accomplish that uh, data sharing. But I think uh, in our symposium discussion, we, we found a lot of questions around, you know, what, what truly is the consumer's financial data? Uh, there are concerns by institutions, uh, likely for competitive reasons over what data might be proprietary around pricing and otherwise. Uh, at the same time, the consumer may very well think that data is their own because they're, you know, it's what they're paying, it's what they're getting, it's the services that they have. So I think there are some, some legitimate questions around that that really do get to uh, why we decided to do the advance notice or proposed rulemaking step uh, as our next step on this topic. I, I, as I noted to the, to the Congresswoman, this is going to be a complicated area for rulemaking and, the, and to, the, to the ranking member as well. There's a broader uh, conversation happening around data privacy and data security that also complicates it. Uh, but we will endeavor to, uh, again, get feedback and think about the smartest way to proceed uh, in this issue. Okay, very good. I want to talk a little bit about... Um... Uh, you know, the, brothers, the idea is today about uh, some of the pandemic problems that we're having with regards to, uh, you know, customers being and consumers being able to pay back their debts and uh, the concerns with regards to reporting on it. You know, one of the concerns I have is with regards to forbearance. Uh, you know, to me, I'm, I'm concerned that if we don't give the regulators or the regulators don't give the banks and credit unions and those, uh, those lenders uh, the ability to give forbearance, I'm concerned that we're going to wind up with, a, with an elongated uh, recovery here that's going to be very uh, difficult to get out of and destroy local economies, destroy businesses, and take away jobs, much as it did in 08 and 09, whenever the regulators came in and basically got rid of you know, wholesale actions of getting rid of lots and lots of, of uh, lines of business. Although your area of, of oversight is a little bit more narrow, it still is in the area where for, uh, forbearance would be a big help to, uh, to some of the consumers. Would you like to comment on that just a little bit? Now, Congressman, you're, you're very uh, correct in that. It is certainly something that many consumers would benefit from and have, frankly, benefited from. The, the first action that we took with the prudential regulators, it was an FFIEC-issued statement, was about accommodating consumers. I do think that my fellow regulators have sent that clear message. Um, so if you're hearing otherwise, we'd love to get some specifics on that so that we can make sure that that is, that is done. So I recognize it gets to safety and soundness issues potentially well, that, that are outside my I appreciate brain. your comments, but my concern is I have been a former regulator. I know that you're, you're, the regulators themselves are hamstrung by the rules and regulations that they have to operate under. So when you go in, much as they did in 08 and 09, they said, okay, well, my, my rules say I have to do this. So therefore, I have to classify this loan, which means I classify the loan. Then you have to reserve more against it, have to have more capital, whatever the case may be. And at some point, then you turn around and, and force the banks to liquidate those loans. We're in a position where if we allow the time that it takes to get these loans back up, because of the uniqueness of this recession that we're in, uh, I think we can get back out of this with minimal damage to a lot of our businesses and therefore our jobs and our local economy. So to me, I've got to build it to fix this problem. I, I appreciate your comments. Thank you very much. With that, I yield back, Madam Chair. Gentlemen from Illinois, Mr. Foster is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair and, and Director Krentinger. 
Um, the the bureau's proposed definition of a qualified mortgage would remove the forty three percent debt to income limit from the QM loan definition and instead use a price based approach that creates a new limit on the spread between a loan's annual percentage rate APR and the average prime offer rate APOR. Uh, now, as someone who's lived through the financial crisis and saw firsthand how much havoc was wrecked our economy uh, from shoddy underwriting practices. Uh, this, to me, shows an amazing confidence in the, in the ability of the mortgage prices to appropriately price risk. Uh, the proposed rule itself identifies several shortcomings which, uh, uh, with relying on pricing. Uh, it says, quote, the Bureau anticipates that a price-based approach would incentivize some creditors to price some loans just below the threshold in order to receive QM status. More broadly, a lender's pricing of, more of a mortgage reflects many factors outside of a, bor a borrower's individual pr risk profile, including uh, prepayment speeds, uh, balance sheet capacity, business goals, and as well as broader economic conditions. And so I'm very concerned with having a definition that could be so easily manipulated. Uh, so, Director Craninger, uh, how will you ensure that this rule does not just incentivize an irresponsible race to the bottom, reminiscent of what we saw in the lead up to the 2008 financial crisis? And if the CFPB acknowledges that the APR can be manipulated by lenders, you know, quote, to meet the mark, unquote, then how can this serve as an effective measure of a borrower's ability to repay? So, Congressman, um, I, I, the nature of a rulemaking process, of course, is that you put a proposal forward and you acknowledge all sides of the argument. So you're definitely uh, doing that with, with the quote in there. But I will say, taking one step back, the requirements of the Dodd-Frank Act remain in effect. So the features that were so concerning during the financial crisis that are precluded from being uh, you know, qualified mortgage and, and precluded from being offered this way, those are, those are still statutorily um, prohibited features. In addition, the statute still requires debt and income to be considered and verified. Uh, so that is part of the proposal as well. It's a premise of the pricing approach. The pricing approach is then what we get to. Uh, the 43% DTI cap, well, we frankly found in 2018, a third of the loans that the GSEs backed had DTIs that were higher than 43%. And many of these loans are performing, and many of these loans are also to uh, those in minority communities. And so, again, thinking holistically about what a pricing approach benefit uh, has, and that is that it, it really does take away, um, it, it provides that opportunity above that, that DTI threshold that's so hard and is uh, going to effect. when it, it will go into effect in January without additional action by me, which is why we put the rule out. But, but we're trying to uh, alter that effect. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm very worried about, um, you know, the word consider. You know, while the, the CFPB's proposal uh, does eliminate the 43% DTI, it, it does, as you say, um, you know, require to consider a borrower's DTI as part of the underwriting process. But it also emphasizes that lenders would be given uh, great latitude in how they considered a borrower's DTI. And I'm concerned that consider is just so loose that, uh, you know, people are going to drive a truck through it and we're going to see this all over again. Um, do you have any? Congressman, if I could, there are standards. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to, I know you probably have other questions, but there are standards proposed in the rule for the debt and income consideration. And we're open to uh, industry and, and consumer groups coming together and coming up with other standards. So there does have to be a standard. Be clear. Yeah, well, I think that it's having some clarity on exactly what consider means, I think, would help a lot in this. Um, and so that's, um, let's say I am I'm close enough to out of time that I think I'm just going to yield back the balance of my time. I don't really have time to get the next one out. Thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Heisinger, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, Madam Chair, at this point, I would uh, prefer if you could uh, go to the next person and uh, and then come back to me if that's okay. 
The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Starvis, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Director, for being here today. I want to thank you for everything you do on behalf of consumers. Uh, I'm really sorry to see that uh, the nature of your agency has gotten so partisan. I'm convinced that's driven by the structure of your agency recently. The Supreme Court, uh, in a Supreme Court opinion, said that your structure violates the separation of the constitutional separation of powers. I'm curious what what actions the agency is either taking or planning to take to ensure some certainty and stability, given the recent Supreme Court decision. You know, certainty and stability in your actions, decisions, and um, the things you do. Congressman, I, as I said, I welcomed the, the decision and the action in this because bringing that stability and certainty is, is certainly what I was hoping to do. And we have um, looked at prior actions that are ongoing, litigation that's ongoing, prior rulemaking actions, and I did ratify uh, those uh, prior actions, again, just in an abundance of caution to make sure that those could continue to be relied on because they, they have been relied on uh, appropriately. And certainly going forward, um, you know, I, I don't know that it, it changes a lot, but we are certainly looking at uh, the opinion still and, and talking to the Justice Department about anything else that that may impact. Thank you, Director. Second, there's been a lot of talk today about your QM rule, and you also temporarily extend the sunset on the GSE patch that is out there. Uh, the Bureau is proposing to extend that patch for six months after the publication in the Federal Register of the final rule. Do you believe six months is an adequate time for the mortgage um, market participants to develop, test, and implement new standards, models, and business operations? Is it possible that maybe 12 to 18 months might be a better transition, especially given everything that's going on with COVID-19 and the pandemic? It is a, a proposal in terms of the time length, and we ask for comment on it. I think, again, based on experience that six months seems uh, appropriate. I will say the pricing threshold is not new. Uh, it is actually part of the current safe harbor and rebuttable presumption of the qualified mortgage. So it's not a new concept and institutions are already doing those calculations. Um, DTI, you know, they're still considering debt and income as required under statute. So it's not precisely a DTI ratio necessarily. Yeah. Be because um, of the, cha the change. I mean, it is a change. It's, it is take a change. the DTI safe harbor at a percentage, get, take it away, it's still considered. You you look at costs more than you are in today's, and it's a little more, um, it is a change. And so I just, I want to ask you to think about how long that transition will take for folks, that's all. No, absolutely. Uh, the next issue I wanted to bring up is uh, online security. With the pandemic, more people are doing things, everything online. And according to the FBI in 2019, victims lost over $221 million to real estate scams and fraud, uh, and that's based only on crimes that were reported. Uh, I've had individual constituents who had mortgage closings where the entire proceeds of the closing have been wired to different accounts through uh, fake emails and scams. And I'm curious what the agency is doing to build awareness on this massive um, you know, consumer problem and what you're doing to help uh, potentially address real estate fraud scams and prevent them in the future. Yeah, the, the, the particular scheme that you mentioned is one that we were aware of. I, I don't recall precisely when, it's been at least a year and a half, I feel like. Um, so that is something that we right away worked with industry on. We actually, I believe, produced a video on that, frankly, that uh, realtors were sending out to their customers uh, close, close to closing to make sure they're aware of that, make sure they know precisely how they should be contacted and where they should be spending closing money. So that is a significant issue. Uh, it highlights the, the need in general to make um, folks aware of the frauds that are out there and certainly to use our enforcement actions to go after fraudsters. I'll say a lot of these things like those online frauds, they're, they're particularly hard because they're- They use offshore accounts, they do lots of other things. So this happened to my constituent about 18 months ago and um, it's uh, something I've become aware of and trying to build awareness of. I ask you to continue to build awareness. You know, we're talking about a quarter billion dollars of reported real estate scams and fraud in 19. So probably it's higher today. And uh, given that more things are moving online, I, I hope you'll continue to look after those consumers because 
they need protection, and we're talking about in many cases somebody's biggest asset and the entire proceeds scammed from them. You're, you're absolutely right. I will say uh, the Department of Justice, the Federal Trade Commission, uh, all of us are, are pretty engaged in this. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Himes, is now recognized for five minutes. Um, thank you, Madam Chairwoman and uh, Director Kreninger. Thanks very much for being with us um, uh, today. Um, I'd like to follow up on uh, the question that uh, Ms. Velasquez was talking to you about, which is um, the revised uh, payday lending rule. Uh, you commented to her that it was your opinion that the rule promulgated under uh, Director Cordray um, resulted in a lower availability of credit, um, and that you, and and I think you implied that the new rule would therefore make credit more available. Um, I understand that, and if I can just frame my question, I think you agree with this framing. Uh, financial regulation is hard because it's always a balance. And always availability of credit is on one side of the balance, and the safety of consumers somehow defined is on the other side of that balance. So I want you just to elaborate, please, for us. Um, presumably, you did a lot of quantitative work, and we don't have the time to get into uh, all of the quantitative work, but I'm really interested if you could give us a minute or two on the revision to the rule will provide how much more credit out there at the cost of how many more people who may find themselves in difficult financial straits, whether that's defined as personal bankruptcy or finding themselves in uh, a situation where debt spiral. Um, I, I'm interested in, in, in what the quantification was of finding that revised balance, uh, balance point. Yeah. Uh, and I, I appreciate your framing as a balance point because I've, I've often found in my public policy life that that seems to be the spectrum we talk on I certainly believe it's my job to protect consumers while, pro while increasing availability of credit. And I don't think it's an either or. Um, I think with respect to this, I'd, I'd offer a few other things. The rulemaking itself did have a substantial and dramatic impact on small dollar credit um, availability as, as its own terms said. So uh, roughly 70% of branches would be closed uh, or those locations would be closed uh, by the rules assessment. But there were other factors I'm sorry, too that affected credit of locations of what of of the payday entitled loan um, outlets, and so, and so and then the distance that people had in terms of availability. But but where I want to get to is also banks and credit unions and others who were uh, also due to other actions, but but also influenced by the rule other guidance issued by regulators that reduced their interest in engagement in this area. And so I think it's not an either or. A couple of things that we're trying to do, one is disclosure testing to look at uh, for those individuals who may be more vulnerable, is that something that will help? There are clearly uh, consumers who understand the product well. There are consumers who pay within the term. The data that we uh, produced in the rule demonstrated that. There's a substantial portion, then there's a substantial portion who also defaulted on the loan very early in the term, you know, very early in the process. That also demonstrates understanding of the product. So how Dr do Dr we I'm support sorry, and I'm help sorry. that I do last want to get an answer to my question. You partly answered it. You said that your work indicated that 70% of payday loan locations would be closed under the old rule. Thank you. That's a very specific uh, checkable fact. Um, but before you go on to the other stuff you're doing, Tell me what the CFPB's analysis showed in terms of the increase associated with bad outcomes, however defined, um, under the new rule. Or is it your belief that there actually won't be an increase in irresponsible borrowing or negative effects as a result of the newly promulgated rule? So I would say the way that that was, um, it was the total lending um, under payday loans that was in that original rulemaking. And I, I think that's where you start to get to a challenge because parsing out what was lost, you don't understand what choice that, that individual consumer was making. What did they, what outcome did they get that may, might have made it worth it to them uh, in terms of that loan? What was the alternate uh, alternative they had at the time? And, and so that's something that, that uh, you know, again, additional research could probably bear out, but, but there is uh, data in the rule that gets to the point that you're making 
Um, I just don't have it at my my fingertips here. Well, I really would. I've got one last question. Um, I really would like to understand. I mean, I really do believe there's a balance here, and, and I really would like to hear from um, you as to kind of what the implications are. If this form of credit is more available, how many more people get themselves in trouble with it? But in, in my very short remaining time, I'm having a hard time. This gets pretty technical, but basically the revised rule eliminates the necessity for a payday lender or other uh, lender to come to a conclusion that there's a reasonable ability to pay on the part of the borrower. And I mean, just for the people watching at home, why, why does that make any sense at all? Why shouldn't a lender undertake a very basic um, process to determine that there is a reasonable ability to repay? Uh, Madam Chairwoman, I, I know time is out, so I, I can- The gentleman time has expired. Uh, could you please respond to the gentleman in writing? Yes, certainly. Thank you, Mr. Himes. She'll respond Thank to you in writing. The Kentucky from uh, the uh, gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Barr, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and welcome back to the committee, Director Craninger. Thanks also for your work to give consumers access to fair, transparent, and competitive markets by focusing your work on clarifying the rules of the road. I do think giving consumers access to competitive markets and clear rules of the road is by definition consumer protection. And because of that good work, I certainly hope this is not your last time in front of this committee. Uh, last July, in my capacity as the ranking member of the Oversight Investigation Subcommittee, I wrote to the Inspector General of the Federal Reserve asking for details about how the Fed reviews the Bureau's budget request prior to approval. This week, the Fed IG published its report uh, this is it. This is the, the report. I think you've probably seen it in response to my letter. Uh, the report and the ensuing briefing with my staff confirm what I initially suspected, and that is that it's more or less a rubber stamp. The Fed only reviews whether the request is within the statutorily mandated cap. If the request is under the cap, the Fed approves the request. There is no back and forth between the Bureau and the Fed. There is no discussion of any line item. Uh, it's just a version of a blank check. And uh, given the fact that, that Dodd-Frank gave the Bureau extraordinary powers, rulemaking, enforcement, adjudicatory powers, including the authority to conduct investigations, issue subpoenas, civil investigative demands, initiate administrative adjudications, prosecute, civil actions in federal court and issue binding decisions in administrative proceedings. And given the fact that the Bureau can seek restitution, disgorgement, injunctive relief, and significant civil penalties for violations of 19 federal statutes under its purview, it is troubling that the Bureau's budget and funding process lacks any meaningful external oversight. So of course, the Supreme Court, um, as many of my colleagues have noted here today, uh, recently held that the Dodd-Frank law violated the separation of powers, uh, concluding that the Bureau's structure limiting the president's power to remove the, the Bureau's single director is unconstitutional. Uh, in my view, this decision properly vindicates the president's power under Article II to supervise and, if necessary, remove those who exercise the president's authority on his behalf. The court's decision holds that the Bureau must be accountable to the president, but I would argue that the Bureau should also be accountable to Congress. And the, the Supreme Court recognized this in its opinion, noting that the lack of accountability is alarming. Uh, and, and the majority uh, co uh, opinion uh, said this, and, and, and I'm quoting, the CFPB's receipt of funds outside the appropriations process further aggravates the agency's threat to presidential control. So there's clearly a lack of accountability at the Fed. And um, I, as you know, I've been a frequent and vocal critic of this lack of transparency and accountability in the Bureau of Spending. I have a bill, uh, the TABS Act, the Taking Account of Bureaucrat Spending Act, which would place the Bureau under the congressional appropriations process. Uh, unfortunately, my colleagues in the majority refused to consider this common sense measure but I want to ask you, Director Kraniger, do you believe that subjecting the Bureau to the congressional appropriations process uh, would enhance accountability uh, and fix this lack of external uh, check? And, and would it in any way diminish your ability or the Bureau's ability to protect consumers? Congressman, I, I certainly appreciate where you're coming from and asking on this. I, I definitely respectfully defer to Congress on determining 
you know, how best to operate this. I, I do take seriously, of course, the internal controls that I put in place in our budget process and, and yeah. believe I'm accountable for the funds. But, but and the IG right. recognized that good work, by the way. The IG recognizes that good work, and that, that's encouraging. Uh, I just think that um, we shouldn't leave it just to the agency um, and, 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 and your leadership. We, we, as representatives of the American people, we owe it to the taxpayers, I think, uh, to also uh, hold the Bureau accountable as well. Let me ask one final question also about the QM uh, rule um, and, the, and, the, and the change to the loan definition, QM loan definition. Can you detail what impacts the rule might have on the portfolio lending market and how might the changes proposed um, would help struggling borrowers during, during uh, especially this time? Um. Uh, certainly providing that certainty with respect to the patch replacement is part of what we think will be helpful um, coming out of, uh, hopefully coming out of the pandemic. Uh, in addition, in terms of helping struggling borrowers, we did take into account and, and asked about uh, how this time period should be treated in terms of that consideration and verification of debt and income for borrowers who may have experienced a hardship. So that's also something that uh, will be part of the ultimate rule. Um, so to, to address that issue that you raised. Thanks for your testimony and your work, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from California, Mr. Vargas, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you for holding this hearing. I appreciate it very much. I uh, also want to thank the director for being here. Thank you very much, director. You did say earlier that it would be nice to take the political temperature down a bit. Um, I don't know if you witnessed when uh, Director Cordray was here yelling and screaming that would normally come from this side, including some of my good friends, uh, that now find it uh, to be political. Sounds like the old Captain Renault in, uh, in Casablanca. Gambling, I'm shocked. The truth of the matter is that in cases like this, we do have different views. And I think that that plays out. I thank God that we have some people who have real tenacity, like our chair, who made sure that Dodd-Frank was in place. I mean, one of the things that would be disastrous right now is if the banks were failing. If we had all of what we have right now because of the pandemic, and if our banks were crumbling and failing at the same time, uh, we would be falling into a deep depression. So I thank God that we put these regulations in. I wasn't here at the time, but I'm very thankful. And of course, oftentimes that comes because of the rub of politics. Uh, I wasn't going to state that, but I think I had to because some of the comments that were made earlier about politics. But I did foreshadow what I was going to ask you about, and that is the issue of these networks and how to prevent fraud and capture fraud. So as you know, the agencies have shown an alarming increase in the financial crime and exploitation during this pandemic. FinCEN has issued two advisories since late May on the medical scams, imposter scams, and money mule schemes targeted at consumers. The FBI has also recently stated in a hearing before the Senate Judiciary Committee that the pandemic has only served to increase the number of stimulus, healthcare bank, elder, and government fraud schemes. The CFPB has ordered a solution to reduce the victimization of elderly individuals. I'm sure you'd agree this solution could also be used to prevent victimization of low-income minority groups that tend to be vulnerable to these schemes as well. Um, could you comment on that? Because I, I do think that these networks could be something that uh, become very helpful. Well, with respect to the elder, prevent, uh, elder fraud prevention and response networks, uh, really fantastic uh, groundswell at the, at the ground level between financial institutions, social service providers, law enforcement, sharing information about what they're seeing. Uh, and, and absolutely, I, I take your point. I would say one of the things that we find, though, with respect to older Americans is the isolation that is further compounded by the pandemic, which is why putting out additional resources at this time on how to build and sustain those networks has been a, a particularly valuable undertaking. Um, but it is, it's, there, there are a lot of different fraud schemes, certainly, that we're keeping an eye on, but that is, that is one population in particular that uh, is further isolated by the pandemic. So I agree, it's a very vulnerable population. You also spoke though earlier about having um, information in Spanish too. Um, obviously, language can be a real issue too in these fraud schemes. Uh, in your opinion, have these networks 
been uh, worthwhile? I mean, I know the, the, the coordination and everything costs money to do this, but have they been effective? Uh, yes, we, we actually have done a, a couple of reports around that uh, and certainly encouraging financial institutions to continue to do the suspicious activity reporting to FinCEN, uh, to their partners, making sure partners have access to that uh, information that's happening too. And so we're really rapidly increasing the, uh, or I guess shortening the time, I should say, for people to be aware of the different schemes and then able to intervene. And lastly, I guess I would ask about forbearance. I know a couple of my colleagues and friends have asked about this already. Uh, under the CARES Act, forbearance is not supposed to be held against you. In fact, uh, I know that now over at the FHFA, uh, the director there um, has stated, and I have language here from his, uh, his note of uh, 51920, that, um, that they're going to attempt to not have this be a negative if you're going to refi or buy another house if you're in forbearance because of the, the great um, interest rates at the moment. But again, I would ask you to take a look at that because this is an extraordinary time moment in our history. And a lot of people that could normally pay their, um, their mortgage uh, are in trouble because of the pandemic. And hopefully we can get over this, get back to a normal. But anyway, I would ask you, as my colleagues did, to follow up on that. And again, I thank you for being here. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Heisinger, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate that. And uh, uh, it is uh, good to uh, have you here today, Director, and I appreciate your time. Um, I, uh, I, I would uh, remind my, uh, my colleague and friend, and he is a friend uh, from California, that there's a number of us that have been uh, amazingly consistent in our belief that the structure of the CFPB uh, needs to be a commission. And uh, whether it was the Duffy legislation in previous, uh, previous Congresses or the TABS Act, as uh, my colleague uh, Mr. Barr was talking about, uh, I do believe that this is uh, the right way to, uh, to have an organization like the FPB. Um, and uh, Director, I guess I'll, I'll ask a question along the lines of, uh, of what my, uh, my colleague, Mr. Barr, was asking, but I'll make, refine it. I understand you don't want to get into the what should Congress do question, uh, but let me ask this. Uh, do you believe that somehow the ability to protect, uh, to protect uh, consumers would be diminished under a structure or a commission structure, I should uh, and would consumer protections be lessened on a commission approach? Uh, Congressman, I'll, I'll certainly say there are other organizations that have commissions, and, and that's something that I'm, I'm sure could be looked at or compared. Um, I, I will say at this point, I, I, it's a, a similar answer to you. I know not fully satisfying that uh, I will allow you all to make that call yourselves and and uh, certainly take any action uh, that Congress uh, directs us to take by law. Well, and I, I fully understand that. I, I guess that's one of our jobs is to ask those types of questions to find out whether those involved and engaged believe that there would be a diminished ability for them to do their jobs. And, uh, and, and that's the nature of, uh, of my question is, is really more along those lines, trying to, uh, trying to make sure that uh, based on your professional experience and your opinion, uh, whether you could effectively do your job with a different structure. Let's say uh, Congress decided to move away from the uh, dictatorial uh, structure that they currently have and decided to make it every single decision you made uh, would be subject to a vote of Congress. I don't think that would be a wise move. I would assume professionally you would uh, you would maybe discourage that. Uh, I, I'm reminded of uh, in the previous administration, uh, the uh, the director uh, uh, Cordray had no problem sharing his opinion uh, with the uh, with the uh, uh, the idea of whether there should be a commission uh, structure or not. So um, I, I'll give you one one last shot at that if uh, if you care to uh, to uh, uh, to expand. Do you think that you yeah. could make that type of structure work? Or Congressman, how about I tackle it this way? Uh, certainly, if I see legislation that I think would be detrimental to 
uh, the, the agency in terms of uh, on this and it's progressing, I will certainly let you know my views. And I, I, I welcome the, the action on structure by Congress, generally speaking, and, and I do believe that Congress would come to a good conclusion on that. Great. Okay. That that is uh, that it, that is helpful. And uh, unlike the uh, the chair, I guess I uh, I hope this isn't your last uh, uh, appearance before this uh, this committee. Um, let's move on to credit reporting and debt collection here. And sorry, I don't see the clock right in front of me, so um, I'll try to move uh, quickly. Um, we we know, and I think oh, so, there was in the CARES Act about credit uh, reporting. That action, um, uh, but we we know that that may be a temporary. Uh, but what might be long term? With Could that could that adversely affect com, uh, consumers? Congressman, I think you're asking about the the credit reporting, um, I, but but you did cut in and out. So if there was a specific question, um, I know we don't have a lot of time left. Yeah. Okay. Well, so uh, what what type of negative uh, uh, effect might there be on credit for consumers if there is not? A uh, credit uh, reporting that is allowed at all. I believe that there's a uh, there was a proper time and is a proper time under the CARES Act to uh, to suspend that. But uh, if this becomes a long term solution, which I know some of my friends on the other side believe ought to happen, that there should never be any sort of actual accurate credit report. Uh, and I'm curious if that the negative effects. Now, accuracy in the system is hugely important. I, I would, I would at least agree with that. And and I know where I've, the gentleman's I've, time has expired. Uh, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Lawson, is required for five is uh, recognized for five minutes. Can you hear me, Mr. Lawson? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Mr. Lawson. Okay, yeah. thank you very much, Madam Chair, uh, and and to you, Madam Chair, and Ranking Member McHenry, I uh, appreciate y'all having me here. And my question centers around, uh, because I have so many uh, students in my area, uh, as you know, the CARE Act provided student loan relief that includes suspending payment interest and collection of government health federal student loans from I think March the 13th through September the 30th, 2020. I'm especially concerned about how credit uh, reporting bureau and the limited data are not complying with the federal Corona uh, virus uh, relief requirements uh, under the CARES Act. Some student loan service appear to be reporting the student loan and delinquents uh, in non-payment status to National Credit Bureau. On, March, on May the 20th, students loan borrowed and filed a class action lawsuit against uh, Great Lake, Lakes and the major credit bureaus uh, for their uh, erroneous credit reporting. Uh, Director, what are you doing to ensure that credit reporting bureau and the lenders that furnish data are complying with the CARES Act and holding accountable uh, to the companies that do, the, that do not? Uh, Congressman, thank you. It, it's an important issue with respect to credit reporting agencies and the furnishers that, of course, provide the data uh, to the credit reporting agencies. And so we we are um, actively engaged uh, in uh, ongoing oversight over FICRA compliance with respect to accuracy and dispute resolution. Uh, and this the CARES Act requirement is, is certainly an overlay of that. One thing we're doing under the pandemic is a prioritized assessment, which is a kind of special exam going in and looking at what is happening right now. Uh, so we are going into furnishers, looking at their compliance uh, overall. That includes uh, in, in all product areas. We, we did an assessment of risk. Uh, we recognize that the student lending space, given CARES Act 
um, requirements was an area that should be looked at. And so we are going in and looking at the furnishing side. We are also talking to the CRAs about how they are uh, engaging on their side as well to make sure that there is compliance happening. Uh, with respect to, um, I think, Great Lakes, there is uh, there were there were some mistakes that were made that were uh, caught very quickly, uh, both through complaints to the bureau uh, and things that uh, consumer advocates and financial institutions noticed. Uh, and there was a very quick resolution. Um, both in how scoring happened and the data that was provided by um, the furnishers. So that was something that was addressed uh, very quickly. And I think it's a, a good example of how quickly we can act when we um, see mistakes are made. Well, that's great. Uh, and, uh, what is the status of that lawsuit at this point? Uh, is it too early to uh, make any comments on it? I'm sorry, Congressman, was there a question there? Or? Yeah, I was just saying, I was trying to see if uh, she could elaborate on the status of the uh, lawsuit at this time, or is it too early to comment on it? Oh, understood. Uh, the, the Bureau is not a party to that lawsuit, so I'm, I'm aware of it, but I, I do not know the, the status of it. Okay. With that, Madam Chair, I, leave, I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Tipton, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair and Director Craninger. Thanks for being here and hope you have an opportunity to do it uh, eight more times, uh, if you'd so choose. Uh, you know, we recently had, and this is a little follow-up to Mr. Heisinga's question, uh, Secretary Mnuchin was before the committee a few weeks ago, and he'd noted that credit reporting agencies, in order to be able to function properly, need to be able to maintain a complete profile of the consumer's credit history, especially during this pandemic. Uh, some proposed legislation that we have uh, would suspend negative consumer credit reports during the COVID-19 pandemic and any other future disaster for a period of 120 days or until the emergency ends. Uh, my view is this would weaken, not increase access to credit as lenders would lose confidence in the accuracy of the information before them. And, I guess my question is, do you agree with Secretary Mnuchin that it's important to be able to maintain complete credit profiles and not alter credit-related data uh, during this pandemic? Uh, well, let me answer it this way, Congressman. The Fair Credit Reporting Act actually holds accuracy in the system as a, a high priority, and the Bureau is tasked with uh, compliance with those requirements around accuracy in the system. It is hugely important. Uh, I appreciate why you're raising the question because there is a concern with respect to the system itself. If, if those lenders who are seeking to do a credit worthiness you know, assessment can't actually access information or trust the system to give them good information, uh, then there's a problem. But we also have a situation where we're looking for alternate data and other uh, sources of information that is going to give a more robust credit picture of a credit worthy borrower. Uh, and so there are a lot of discussions around what happens in the credit reporting system. I, I clearly recognize that as well, and, and certainly within, uh, with respect to, to making sure that those, um, you know, minority uh, communities as well, that individuals actually have information in the credit reporting system that will enable them uh, to get credit if they're credit worthy. Great, and thank you. Uh, you know, as we previously discussed, uh, responsible debt collection, uh, is an important part of maintaining access to credit for consumers and ensuring good access to credit is more important now than ever, uh, especially in rural places like the ones I represent. But the technology has changed dramatically since the last time the debt collection rules were updated and CFPB has proposed common sense reforms allowing mandatory disclosures in the body of an email to be able to ensure consumers have access to important information in a timely manner but communication is a two-way street, and both collectors and consumers should be able to communicate with one another electronically, especially during this pandemic. Uh, my question is, would the Bureau consider allowing an exemption from the eSign Act requirements for validation notices for companies who are otherwise complying with the FDCPA requirements and rules? Uh, Congressman, we, we have recognized some of the challenges with eSign Act requirements um, pursuant to the pandemic and did provide some flexibility. 
Uh, I'm not uh, aware of a, a concern or, or conflict with FDCPA or, or other challenges with respect to, to that, but I can tell you that our debt collection notice of proposed rulemaking does address uh, electronic communications uh, in addition to obviously continuing to preclude harassing communication, trying to facilitate that two-way communication that you talked about is mm -hmm. uh, important, setting some bright line rules for it and enabling um, individuals to communicate the way they want to communicate, whether that is receiving texts or receiving emails rather than getting phone calls, for example. So uh, those things are all uh, addressed in the rule and we're pouring through comments right now to, to uh, think through the right approach going forward. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Stivers brought up some issues in regards to technology and fraud, uh, but could you maybe expand a little bit on uh, the financial technology and how it's changed during the pandemic and how you're monitoring the regulatory environment uh, around the technology to be able to make sure that consumers can safely access the important tools? Uh, that, that is critically important. Clearly, we have a, a number of processes that uh, contemplated in-person interactions or expect that, and uh, we've done a lot to address it uh, in terms of appraisal processes um, and, and other processes in terms of particularly mortgage uh, loans and mortgage origination. Uh, so it is something that we're looking at. The Bureau also is engaged in uh, technology sprints to think about, again, how do we promote electronic disclosure um, but the point that you raise is, is a real one and that, that uh, Congressman Stivers did. You have to take into account fraud and, and other um, cybersecurity issues, privacy issues with that data. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gonzalez, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for, for being here before us. Our, our nation has a patchwork of mortgage protections in place, and this uh, fact is reflected on the uh, Consumer Protection Bureau website, which highlights that we have one uh, system in place for at least the federally backed mortgages. And up until now, we've relied on the tendency of non-federally backed loans to simply follow along the path. Uh, while many lenders have voluntarily given similar relief as the federally backed programs, consumers are not protected in this lending space uh, for COVID-induced foreclosures and financial uh, problems. Uh, first, how is the Consumer uh, Financial Protection Bureau helping consumers with non-federally backed mortgages, and uh, do you have the tools and authority that you need to help these folks? Uh, thank you, Congressman. There, there are obviously distinctions there with respect to CARES Act treatment. Uh, one thing that we did in, very early on in the pandemic was clear direction uh, to all entities subject to our, juris, our responsibility, our regulated entities, their first responsibility is accommodation of customers during this time, uh, consistent with safety and soundness and compliance with consumer protection law. So that does send the strong signal to all those that are regulated, including those uh, entities that are um, uh, servicing non-federally backed loans uh, about those requirements. And, and I would say, generally speaking, the information that we have is that uh, the right steps are being taken there, but we also have the backstop of our supervision and enforcement activities uh, to ensure that uh, that is the case and that they are um, complying with the law. Okay. Changing the subject just for a second to landlords, what can a landlord do who's not getting their rent but has eviction problems and foreclosures looming? How are, how are they getting uh, help, especially smaller landlords? I, I will say, Congressman, the, the landlord tenant issues are, are a little bit outside of our purview. We have the res we, we took on the responsibility, recognizing the need for one federal government website to provide that avenue for uh, landlords, tenants, uh, borrowers, uh, everyone to get information from one site. So we do have cfpb.gov uh, slash housing, but it's really uh, HUD and uh, a few other um, dynamics there in the states that that have the avenues for uh, and resources for folks to follow. But we're trying to make at least a conduit is one place to go for that information. So we are housing that information. Yeah, that's a concern, just particularly smaller uh, landlords. Uh, do you feel uh, like the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, uh, which requires many financial institutions to maintain report and publicly disclose uh, loan level information about mortgages, is uh, useful in detecting uh, discrimination in the marketplace? 
No, I, I, that is one of the purposes of the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, and uh, certainly the collection of that information does provide uh, transparency to the marketplace and, and to the public um, and is useful to agencies. We do use that information uh, on a regular basis to engage in uh, fair lending analysis and to understand what's happening in the, in the marketplace. Are there improvements that you believe could be made? Um, we are continuing to improve the way that we make that data available. Uh, I have also um, looked to work with our partner agencies around how we do the fair lending analysis. Each agency does it slightly differently, and frankly, I'd like to better understand that. So we've been trying to get the economists together uh, from each of the agencies to, to see how uh, they're doing that analysis, frankly, to help also institutions because many of them do the analysis themselves to also ensure compliance with the law. So I think there's a real opportunity to look at how we analyze that data, thinking about it, sharing it, understanding what it, uh, what it means and understanding what we're looking for. So that's a dialogue that I have uh, sought to further. Thank you, and we look forward to working with you on that. And uh, I yield back. Thank, Thank you. you. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Williams, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you, Chairman, for being here today. And uh, before I begin my questions, I just want to echo what we've heard quite a bit today uh, about the Supreme Court and their decision that said the current structure of the CFPB is unconstitutional. And I think you've been a 100% improvement over the first director. I still think it would benefit everyone if there was greater oversight and less power concentrated in one individual. Now, Director, the economic recovery from the coronavirus is going to be driven by small businesses, Main Street America, opening the doors and hiring back workers. These businesses are going to need to adjust their storefronts and business models to make the necessary changes to make this happen and to satisfy state and federal safety guidelines. The ability for a business to access capital will be critical during this time. So the CFPB is under a settlement agreement to adhere to a predetermined timeline to issue a rule regarding small business data collection in accordance to Dodd-Frank Section 1071. As I've mentioned to you before, you and I have talked about this, I have serious concerns with the effect that this rule will have on the cost of capital to all businesses. So could you please give us an update timeline on the implementation of this rule and tell us how you will ensure that these actions will not inhibit small businesses and Main Street from getting loans? Uh, yes, Congressman, I, I absolutely understand your concerns and, and, uh, and frankly share some of them as well. I will say that Section 1071, of course, is a mandatory rulemaking uh, in the Dodd-Frank Act, even in my confirmation process, I, I pledge to make that a priority because it is a required rulemaking. So we are engaged in that effort. Uh, we uh, are issuing a SABRIFA outline by September 15th. Um, so that is the small business regulatory relief process where we sit down with a panel of affected small businesses uh, with the SBA, with OMB, and go through that outline and get comments so it is a kind of early stage in rulemaking process. So we will have a draft proposal out by September 15th, and this fall we'll engage in that process of discussion of that draft. And then the next step uh, after that would be a notice of proposed rulemaking, but we have not come up with any firm timeline mm -hmm. for that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, on June 18th, the Bureau announced a pilot advisory opinion program that would allow businesses to try out new, uh, new products and services without fearing that CFPB would uh, come down with some enforcement actions for trying something new. Uh, this is a welcome step towards providing more certainty to the private sector, as often fearful that they will be targeted by uh, your agency. So, uh, Director, how have you been publicizing this pilot program to industry participates, uh, participants, and can you give us an update on how many people have submitted requests to be a part of this program? All right, so I'm sorry, which, which pilot program? It's called the Pilot Advisory Opinion Program. Oh, the advisory, absolutely. Uh -huh. I wanted to make sure I had Sorry. the right pilot program. That's okay. Uh -huh. uh, so the Advisory Opinion Program uh, is out for comment right now. So it, it will go final. Uh, we're just, we, when we collect data from an entity, we need to actually do the Paperwork Reduction Act. So needless to say, we launched the pilot, but we expect to be fully going soon. Um, it, it, it's an interpretive rule that we would be issuing. Uh, we have not gotten any applications yet, but any entity that is seeking an interpretation or additional information about how to comply because they have a particularly challenging issue. Uh, what happened prior to this program is they would send us an email through, a, through our, our site and we would send them back some answer. 
Right now, though, I think that process should be transparent. I think all of the entities that are equally situated should actually benefit from getting that information, and it should happen formally from the agency and not just informally through trade groups or otherwise when someone actually gets that you know, useful piece of paper. Sure. So that's, that's what we're hoping for with the advisory opinion program. Thank you. Uh, I'm in the credit business. And uh, when this whole pandemic began, I said I did not want to see a person's credit score like we saw in 2008, ruined as a result of the pandemic and the mandated government shutdown. So as you know, the CARES Act, and we talked about this, included provisions for lenders uh, to work with their customers who make changes to their credit accommodations, such as adjusting or delaying certain payment agreements, uh, while at the same time ensuring the integrity of the credit reporting system is kept intact, which is very important. Last week, TransUnion released a report that uh, shows delinquencies decreased uh, in June on a month-to-month -month basis, which makes it seem that people are still managing their finances and debt responsible, with responsibility throughout this pandemic and that the CARES Act provisions have been working. So quickly, uh, uh, Director, does this data point uh, released by TransUnion align with what your bureau is saying? Uh, yes, it does. Thank you. I yield my time back. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Michigan, Ms. Talib, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, thank you, Director, for being here. I uh, appreciate your time. Uh, I'm actually in the people's business. Uh, that's what I do is help people. And I know during this pandemic, uh, your bureau um, received a number, a record number of complaints. I think 42,000, a little bit over 42,000 in April, and a little over 44,000 complaints in May. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about this. I know um, it's about a 60% increase, Director. So I just want to know if my resident is calling and, of course, you know, they, they qualify for forbearance. They're calling over to their mortgage company. Then they call you all. What is the process that they go through to get your help and your advocacy to make sure that this mortgage servicer is complying? So that complaint is uh, processed immediately, sent to the relevant company. We do a little bit of quality control on that in terms of it, making sure it's something that can be responded to, uh, but that is sent to the company. And I did get a little bit of an update from a prior question about the average response time. So our average response time of the consumer getting an answer from the company is nine days. So that is what is uh, generally happening in terms of the issue that they're raising. Do you know, um, that's great uh, in some cases, uh, do you know what the resolutions are? I mean, are they just contacting via email or are they resolving the issue? Because what I'm hearing from residents is they qualify for forbearance, but the um, servicer, mortgage servicer is kind of giving them a runaround. So it is a response. We do quality control on the responses back. We also, particularly with respect to mortgage services and the CARES Act forbearance and the issues that are happening right now, we're looking at all of those um, so can you a, a, you know, to see if there's yeah. an issue with a particular servicer. So give me an example of one that you all resolved. Um, and it doesn't have to be mortgage. I know the next number one issue folks call about is credit cards and then issues with their consumer report or credit report. Well, the, the one that has gotten a lot of attention, it certainly got my attention, was in late March and early April. We did get a significant number of, of complaints submitted around concern about payment of mortgage payments and around the uh, forbearance option that was given to servicers when they would have to pay um, because the initial information from servicers was, we'll put you in 90-day forbearance, you're going to have to pay that full 90-day deferral after the 90 days because that is the way the, the process tends to work in normal times. Um, so that concern came through loud and clear because people said, I, I can't pay now. I'm sure not going to be able to pay in 90 days. Uh, that is something that we took very seriously. I talked to FHFA in particular, but HUD, all of us came together as federal partners and said, that really doesn't make sense. That resulted in uh, some guidance from them, but also an interim final rule adjusting our mortgage servicing rules to make clear that, that the option that can be offered is deferred to the end of the mortgage um, period. So that is to the end of the loan, a lump sum payment at the end. And that was, a, a, I think, a demonstration of how this can work and how it should yeah. work. And Director, in that case, that service, uh, it was just that mortgage servicer it wasn't any other companies they just tried to find it so we had to actually school them and get the actual accurate 
guidance that that's not how they have to do it. So what happens to them when they do that? I mean, what do you do? I mean, smack them on the hand. I mean, what what exactly happens? So I think my worry is, is, you know, what else are they doing um, that, you know, if they can get away with it or maybe we don't find out about it. You know, some people don't even know to call you. Uh, your your brewery. Just curious what happens in that case. Do they get fined or something? Uh, yeah, absolutely. If they are not complying with the law, they they can have to pay restitution. There are other outcomes. I'll say the example I gave you is a good example of where that they, they were doing what they should do, um, mm-hmm. but it was not the outcome that any of us would want. Yeah. Uh, so I think there are a lot of examples uh, across yeah. the board, but, but making sure we address servicers who are not taking uh, compliant action with the law is important too. Um, and the last question, I mean, are you all, um, do you work with other departments? One of the things I've noticed is if there's a huge, um, am I, is that, yeah, I think, if, if there, you see, do you all ask or see a pattern of complaints maybe from communities of color? And do you work with uh, the Civil Rights Division within the Department of Justice if you see a pattern of discrimination uh, based on someone's color, you know, um, ethnic background, faith, and things like that? But primarily, uh, I'm seeing a huge impact on African American community and, and people of color. I'm wondering what your bureau is doing to work with other agencies to push back on that. Uh, definitely, if we see a pattern or practice there, we we are uh, we we have our own authorities, obviously, to, to act under ECOA, but we also do make referrals to DOJ and work with them closely. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. The gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Hill, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate the opportunity to have this hearing, Director Craninger. Want to commend you for leading the agency during this very difficult time of COVID-19. Given the current economy, many of us in Arkansas and many of our families have been uh, really navigating a tough uh, consumer financial space. I want to thank you for the agency for doing a number of good updates uh, and helpful aspects to your website. We've been using these routinely newsletters we send out several times a week on the COVID-19 crisis and the material has been very beneficial to consumers. So please thank your team for uh, the extra efforts uh, to communicate. Uh, I want to touch uh, director on the topic that Dr. Foster uh, spent quite a bit of time on, which is your revisions uh, for the uh, qualified mortgage rule. He walked through, I think, the background quite clearly and A lot of us are concerned about uh, will this uh, rule approach that you're taking that you put out for comment uh, lead us down a a road towards weaker credit underwriting, credit underwriting by the um, banks or by the federal entities that uh, insure or purchase those loans. Uh, And you did a good job answering his question, so I won't belabor that point, that the DTI is just one of many uh, considerations uh, to be taken in in underwriting. But since that's true, what's your philosophy here? I mean, all bankers uh, uh, take into a variety of compensating factors when underwriting a loan. Uh, Why is, what do you view that uh, it's necessary to replace the DTI definition with something that appears pretty open-ended. I think Congressman, the, and I appreciate your interest in this it's an important uh, marketplace, uh, clearly for mortgages for many Americans. Um, the, the point that you just made is precisely why uh, we're moving from DTI solely to a pricing approach, because it really does bring in uh, the, the more holistic considerations of the borrower's credit worthiness, and certainly you would expect and want uh, responsible <laughs> lenders to be pricing in the risk that they see, and, and that's a, a different approach than a hard debt-to-income ratio that, uh, frankly, at 43%, but frankly, as we looked at what, what would be uh, a, an acceptable DTI threshold if you were going to stay at that, and we, in fact, you know, asked that question in the rulemaking, um, but clearly at 43%, we know we're keeping a lot of credit-worthy borrowers, and particularly borrowers of color, out of um, the qualified mortgage market. 
Thank you, thank you for that. Do you have any concern about uh, that granting a safe harbor to underwriting standards of third party guidelines could be too open ended? Are you concerned about that? So it, it isn't just third party arbitrarily, it is third party guidelines that we would have to um, actually uh, recognize. So there is that check and in the process. Would, and I think we'll. You would approve I'm those, sorry, sir. your agency would approve those guidelines? Yes, that is that is uh, what okay. is proposed. So, so it would allow let me switch, innovation. Let me switch subjects and talk about the difference between uh, the 150 basis points pricing range that you've uh, considered, uh, and yet uh, for the for the safe harbor, uh, you think it should be 200 points uh, for the QM. Don't you think that spread could do two things? One, create a potential for misunderstanding in lawsuits uh, and that it would actually deter private sector players from making the loan? And could that even shift it more to a government type loan, such as an FHA loan? Are you concerned about that spread? Well, it, certainly it's a proposal, Congressman, so we absolutely want comment on that to the extent that, that uh, anyone in the public has data that would demonstrate a greater risk. We outlined, you know, why we chose that threshold, and it's not too different from the thresholds that uh, are already recognized in the current um, QM, uh, because there is a pricing threshold differential between the uh, safe harbor and the rebuttable presumption now. Uh, so the APR, APOR spread is something that's in the current system. Um, but again, uh, you know, looking at, looking at um, we, we looked closely at performance over the last many years. That data is in the rule, uh, and we welcome comments on, uh, you know, alternate uh, concepts or, or risks that uh, might be introduced here. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Iowa, Ms. Acme, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman, and thank you, Director Craninger, for being here. I'd love to start with some positive news by thanking you and your staff for taking some time um, to give us some feedback on a bill I introduced a couple months ago uh, to create a working group with the CFPB and the SEC to help protect consumers and investors from fraud. So thank you for that. I do hope we can move forward uh, to get your two agencies working together to prevent Americans from being taken advantage of. And I also appreciate the website you set up with information on the prepaid debit cards that a lot of Americans received. Wish that uh, had been communicated earlier, um, and my colleagues and I may not have had to push the Treasury to make those improvements, but thank you for those two, uh, two pieces. Uh, I want to go back to the last time you were here. Uh, you had just signed an information sharing agreement with the Department of Education on student loan servicers marking the first time in more than two years that information was properly being shared. Um, but two years is far too long uh, to go without full compliant information that we need to understand how the $1.6 trillion of student loan debt is being handled. Uh, I'm glad that part is resolved, but it should have been done much sooner. However, not only did that agreement not restore the supervisory MOU, uh, the last time you couldn't even tell me when that would be done. Uh, in September, just a month from now, we'll be at three years without the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau properly supervising student loan servicers for the 40 million Americans with these loans. So I'm going to ask you again, when are regular exams of student loan servicers going to resume? Uh, Congresswoman, I'm, I'm happy to be able to tell you that they have already resumed. So we started, uh, and that, that was the lag time, frankly, between the February House hearing and the March Senate hearing. I managed to get that done in February so that the uh, supervisory exams commenced. Um, and so there are no barriers to us doing the supervision work that we need to do uh, in the student loan space. And our, uh, we're working very closely with the Department of Education so they can continue to do their contractual oversight, but we are pursuing our own um, information requests, we are getting that information, uh, and we are engaging in those exams. Well, perfect. Um, from what I've heard, though, um, I believe that there's been one exam done, and that was in March. Is that correct? Uh, Congresswoman, we do not uh, stipulate what exams are happening in what product areas. I made the exception by at least trying to show Congress recognizing the great interest in this. 
that one so I, happened, I appreciate but I can tell you that the number but have you have you done any exams since that march exam uh, there are no barriers in our way. We're doing all the exams that we would like to do. That's that's what I can say uh, at this point in time. And I know that's not satisfactory well, to you, but we don't talk well, about the numbers of exams we do in any given industry. So, okay. Well, I so I'm going to take that as a no, because if you can't tell me that you've had more than one exam um, and you won't answer the question, I'm assuming that that's a no. So when will, my, I'd like the question well, answered, when will regular that's, that's exams no. I, I don't. I don't want to parse words with you, but it is definitely not a no. We are engaged in every exam that we need to be in the student loan space. So how many ex exams have you had? Again, that's not a publicly disclosed number. It's not in any area except our total number of exams conducted. We don't uh, issue exam numbers publicly in each industry. So I'm, I'm just asking, so, so what the, what's the total number? So you don't issue it for each industry? How are then no, we supposed we to get the information and, that we and need? Never, and never have. So again, well, that, um, that, I, I'm... That's, sir. That's certainly a problem that we're going to have to figure out because how are we going to make sure that there's oversight of these uh, 40 million loans that uh, that are you know people in this country need to have oversight of if we can't get that information and you're not willing to tell me how many you've done within this industry that was the specific question. I, I understand it is not a publicly available number. It's something that I I I think is appropriate given the confidential nature of supervision. Uh, same with the number of investigations that we have ongoing in any industry. We don't actually disclose that publicly, uh, given the confidential nature. Uh, certainly when it's public, uh, we do have a number of ways to do that, and I'm absolutely looking at this. But I, I am trying to tell you that it is not, uh, well, it is not any obfusc obfuscation. This is important, and we are engaged in every exam that we need to be. Uh, well, listen, from what I've been told, there's been one examination, and I believe there should be around, uh, there's about 12 servicers, 10 to 12, that would need an examination. So I think we're not, uh, fa I think we're failing the people in this country right now. I yield back. You were told there was one exam because I am the one that actually publicly released that there's been at least one exam. So we just went all through all that, and now you just said that there's been one exam. I yield back. We'll explore that a little bit further, Ms. Um The gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Emmer, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Director Craninger, for being here today for the great work you're doing. Unfortunately, under the Obama administration, Democrats created an agency completely unaccountable to the American people. Outcomes and oversight of the agency were by no means transparent. We've also unfortunately faced unnecessarily partisan attempts to reform the structure of the Bureau by putting it on a budget and creating a bipartisan board. On a brief personal note, Director Craninger, I want to sincerely applaud you to being open and accessible to every member. Uh, my staff and others constantly praise your efforts to be responsive to our requests for input and feedback. I know this willingness to meet and discuss policy occurs across the aisle as well. So I just wanted to, make, to take a moment to thank you for your service. I also wanted to thank Paul Watkins and the work you're doing to advance inclusion through FinTech innovations. This is one of our top priorities at the committee and at the FinTech task force. He didn't receive the most welcoming comments from the majority when he came before us, but advancing FinTech innovation to help those in need should be a nonpartisan issue. Now more than ever, families have access to options to cover unexpected, need to have access to options to cover unexpected costs. For many, short-term lending can be a lifeline in difficult times. Abuse cannot occur, but this must remain an option. Your work to ensure borrowers have, borrowers have access to loans will increase competition and choice in the marketplace at a time when it is so desperately needed. Uh, turning for a moment to ongoing litigation started by the past administration. Uh, Director Craninger, I noticed that in your budget request, there is no mention of the funds the Bureau expends to continually pursue Cordray era litigation. Can you please speak to the cost of that ongoing litigation? Um, there, certainly the, the Bureau continues to engage in litigation um, both before and, and uh, under my term, and, and also litigation that um, 
Director Mulvaney uh, approved at the time that he was director. Uh, there is a cost, uh, obviously, as you noted, and we do include in the budget lines for expert witnesses and document production and things like that. But I, I don't think, uh, Congressman, I can give you a, a specific delineation for, um, you know, which which director signed off on which enforcement action and, and what the litigation uh, costs have been. But, but uh, certainly there are some complex litigation cases that we are still involved in uh, that, that are costly, but uh, I've deemed them necessary to continue. Uh, I'd love to follow up with you outside of the hearing on that. Uh, listen, I share the concerns of my colleague, French Hill, when it comes to, well, I also share the praise uh, that uh, uh, Mr. Hill was giving you for your work to update the qualified mortgage rules. But I, I do uh, share his concerns uh, uh, that he raised with you, and I'm not going to go over those again. Appreciate you being aware of them and, and uh, appreciating the concern. And now that we have a definitive answer that CFPB's leadership structure does violate the separation of powers, I'm curious about your plans regarding transparency and accountability. Given these developments and under your leadership, where do you plan to take the CFPB? Uh, Congressman, certainly since I was I was named and, and testified before you all the first time, uh, that has been something that is significantly important to me, uh, given my public service career. So we are uh, endeavoring to engage in that transparent dialogue in every aspect of what we do. I'd say the advisory opinion program that was recently launched is a great example of that. Again, we're providing guidance or, or interpretive, essentially interpretations to one entity that asks. Uh, but through that advisory opinion process, we're making that public. Uh, and we are providing that interpretive rule uh, to everyone so that they can see what the rules of the road actually are and it's not just benefiting one entity or who that entity decides to share that with. Um, so that is one example. And certainly our, our rulemaking efforts as well uh, in trying to ensure that we are uh, fully transparent there. My uh, colleague Andy Barr was asking about congressional oversight of your budget. Uh, and I know you didn't want to step in uh, to Congress's role, but could you answer the question? I uh, would congressional oversight of your budget uh, inhibit your ability to do uh, the job as director? Uh, Congressman, I've, I've endeavored not to get into that, but I, I will certainly acknowledge that I was a longtime appropriation staffer on both sides of the Hill. <laughs> I'm sure we'll talk more. Thank you for your time, Director. Uh, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. We have now reached the end of group one. The committee will stand in recess for five minutes while the room is cleaned.
The gentlewoman from California, Ms. Porter, is recognized for five minutes. Director Craninger, would your proposed rule to eliminate the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act prohibit repeated calls from debt collectors? Congresswoman, uh, harassment is still going to be illegal uh, under that rule. What we're trying to do is set a bright line rule, and we proposed one. Director so, Kanger, yes, I the, Director the hope Kanger, is to have a bright line rule. Director Kanger, I know it was a little bit hard to hear there at the start, so let me start over. Would your proposed rule to implement the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act prohibit repeated calls from debt collectors? So, uh, Congresswoman, it's a proposal, and it did, in fact, propose a limit on the number of calls great. that could be received in a week. Yes. 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 Great. Good work. Would it prohibit those debt collectors from making calls harassing families and friends? Uh, well, yes. Harassment's already precluded uh, by the law. So, we can agree that harassing practices by debt collectors are something that you can probably pretty comfortably say falls within the jurisdiction of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Yes. Great. Um, in the last four years, has the Bureau taken any enforcement actions to punish medical debt collectors that break the law and harass consumers? So we have taken public enforcement actions against debt collectors. I am not sure about the, uh, you know, uh, what kind of debt uh, off the top of my head. Okay. I'm specifically asking about medical debt collectors. Have you taken any enforcement actions against medical debt collectors? That break uh, I understand. I understand the question, Congresswoman. I do not have an answer for you at the top of my head. Many of the debt collectors actually collect on behalf of multiple clients. Uh, so it is very possible. Okay, so let me add, let me answer that for you. The CFPB has taken zero, zero actions against medical debt collectors. So if you're just tuning into this hearing, here's what you've missed, nothing. You've missed nothing because that's what the CFPB has been doing to protect you against predatory medical debt collection, even in the midst of a terrible pandemic. The CFPB, Mr. Ms. Craninger, was created to protect consumers. That's its mission, that and nothing else. Would you consider it pro-consumer to not enforce the law to prevent consumers from being illegally abused by debt collectors? There were a lot of caveats in that statement, Congresswoman. Let me just tell you that we are committed to enforcing the law. I am committed to enforcing the law. And we have taken action against uh, a number of practices in the debt collection space, including through our supervisory efforts. So it is not just the public enforcement actions that you're citing, certainly supervision. We've issued supervisory highlights that articulate uh, what we've done in the debt collection space. But we provide information to consumers about their expectations but Kriminger, in debt collection. Just to be clear, if I'm a debt collector, if I'm a medical debt collector, I can break the law under your CFPB and know that there is a zero percent, if I'm if the past predicts the future, and we're looking back at the past four years, that there is zero percent chance that I will get sued. How is that robustly enforcing the consumer mission of the agency? Congresswoman, no I respectfully no disagree database. with you. There is no, uh, certainly no guarantee that that is the case. And I would endeavor to have you give us information on any debt collectors that you are concerned about their practices. We absolutely follow up on them. It is a career decision to open but an investigation at the CFPB. Time. And I welcome any information that you have on bad practices. But Ms. Kreninger, in your own, Dr. Kreninger, in your own database, in the CFPB's own database, there are thousands of complaints about medical debt collectors. Each time you come before this committee, I appreciate that you welcome me to do your job for you, but my job is to make sure you're doing it. I wanted to ask you about something else. Are you familiar with Mike Hodges, H-O-D-G-E-S? Uh, no, I do not believe I am. You aren't? I don't believe so, no. 
Um, he is the CEO of Advanced Financial, one of the country's largest payday lenders. Do you know how much he's donated to the Trump campaign? I have no idea, nor do I care. Um, so you don't know anything about him. Let me read you this quote. I've gone to RNC to Ron McDaniel and said, Rana, I need your help on something. She's been able to call over to the White House and say, hey, we have one of our large givers. They need an audience. The White House has been helpful on this particular rule we're working on right now. That was Mike Hodges in October 2019. Do you know what he was talking time. about? Time. The gentle lady's time has expired. What did they do? The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Davidson, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, Director Traninger, thank you and your team for all the work you're doing to protect America's consumers. I uh, appreciate having you on the job. Uh, I wanna say a special thanks to Paul Watkins and the attention he's given, not just to FinTech, but to privacy. So uh, in your proposed rulemaking on privacy, uh, I guess I'm looking at the scope of, of privacy. You think about the key things for consumer protections, uh, their data, and the use of it has really defined a lot of this age, whether it's data breaches or the way that any number of companies have monetized uh, the access to data that consumers have. So what's the scope that you're looking at and how do you use that to protect consumers? Uh, absolutely, Congressman. I believe you're referencing the Section 1033 um, policy discussion that we're having now about consumer authorized access to their own financial data. Uh, it is uh, a complex issue. Certainly the Bureau issued principles and, and privacy and data security are, are part of that consideration for how best to enable um, that data access for consumers. We had a symposium a few months ago. Uh, we just issued the report out from that uh, symposium and announced that we would engage in an advance notice of proposed rulemaking. I think it, it is a complex area. There are um, a lot of issues to consider that we're looking forward to getting more data on uh, but I would say that there has been progress made in moving away from screen scraping uh, as the means by which um, many aggregators would get uh, consumers' financial data using their um, bank credentials and having that be provided by the consumer. Uh, that's something that, that is, is not uh, a best practice, certainly. Uh, and so moving in the direction of uh, APIs so that there's an automated um, data transfer that can happen and that there is more control on both sides. Um, but that's something that we are uh, really looking to uh, have a more extensive dialogue around and that's what we announced last week. Well, when you think about the consumer protections uh, with respect to di data, uh, the work you're doing there is critically important in large measure because Congress has failed to act. We don't have a comprehensive data protection law uh, for all consumer activities in the United States. We have a somewhat outdated uh, Graham Leach Bliley Act uh, that I think you proposed to update, but there are lots of data uh, houses uh, that make use of this that aren't covered by Graham Leach Bliley. So uh, do you feel like you have the authority or scope to do everything that you would need to protect consumer data? So, Congressman, you're raising an interesting issue here with respect to not just 1033, but more globally. Um, we do have, uh, I think, a, a number of issues around privacy and data security uh, with standards in California and Europe and, and what happens in the U.S. And uh, there are many uh, parts of this that are outside the CFPB's purview. So, specifically, uh, the safeguards in the Graham Leach Bliley Act are outside the authority of the CFPB generally. Um, so that, that just to make you aware, I am actually looking at um, privacy and data security broadly and, and may have uh, some requests of Congress or some suggestions around that. So I'm looking at that internally, um, particularly as it comes to credit reporting, because that's where we have at least a little more of uh, an engagement and a responsibility there, particularly as it comes to our supervisory work. 
Um, but, I, but I'll certainly get back to you on that and, and others. I know it's of great interest. But with Section 1033, we do have the ability to take this into account uh, as we think about how best to move forward in that. Thank you very much uh, for your attention to it. There's really no excuse for Congress's failure to uh, provide this safeguard for all America's consumers. Uh, and uh, I hope that I can collaborate broadly for a good bipartisan solution on privacy, not just with respect to government, warrantless surveillance and things like that, but consumer financial data. Uh, our seniors are especially vulnerable and I appreciate the work you're doing to safeguard our seniors. And I think the last thing I'd say is, as you have conversation with the members of SSOC, with our treasury and everything else, most of America has their assets in US dollars. It is the store of value, it is the means of exchange. And this uh, idea that we can, in an unlimited way, just continue to print money uh, and not damage the value of all the other dollars is foolish. We've printed an awful lot of money. We haven't truly borrowed it because there's not a real lender. And um, you know, I just uh, urge you to weigh in where you can on the importance of protecting the US dollar as a store of value and means of exchange. And for that purpose, uh, my colleagues and I recently for formed the Sound Money Caucus. Thanks again for what you do to protect America's consumers. And I yield. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kasten, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Director Craninger. I, uh, I think I'd probably speak for all of us on this committee saying that I, when I woke up this morning and was going through the news headlines, was completely gobsmacked, for lack of a better word, to see that the GDP has collapsed by almost 33% in the last quarter. That is well outside the range of challenges that I anticipated I was going to be grappling with uh, when I was asked to serve on this committee. I, I suspect, Director Craninger, it's probably outside the scope of yours as well. Um, as the old Monty Python skit says, nobody, nobody plans for the Spanish Inquisition, right? <laughs> um, um, I think all of us knew it was going to be, it was going to be difficult. Um, we did have leading indicators. The, your own bureau in the case of leading indicators is, is an, unfortunately the case when the economy gets tight, unscrupulous actors emerge. And as, as uh, Congresswoman Tlaib was, was calling out, I think you saw an all time record for consumer complaints at the department in March, um, which was then topped in April. A new record was set in May, a new record was set in June. During the Q2, you're basically running about 50% above historic complaints at the CFPB. In spite of that, you've had 13 public enforcement actions uh, this calendar year, which basically puts you on track to finish about at the level of 24 that you did last year, which as the Wall Street Journal has reported is down 80% from the 2015 peak. My question for you is that why has the CFPB decided against taking enforcement actions? despite the rise in complaints that Americans are feeling during this economic downturn? Congressman, uh, we are taking robust action uh, using all of our tools, and certainly that includes enforcement. So uh, I would uh, ask you to reserve judgment until we actually get to the end of the year and see where we end up. I will not manufacture well, I, I, enforcement cases, but I will take the right action against bad actors and we do have a number of uh, actions in the pipeline that I have authorized that I expect to see move forward. So I, well, I will uh, at least note that. I, I want to just hang on, to, because you said to Congresswoman Tlaib that you are averaging nine days between when the complaint comes in and you respond. I just gave you data going back to March that's 50% up. You're saying you've gone through, you've gotten back to people in nine days, but you haven't decided what to do with that yet? Oh, Congressman, the complaints are different from enforcement actions. So the complaints I, I, uh, do I, get I, resolved in nine days I, uh, I understand. on their initial response. Okay, so on April 1, your bureau issued a statement which said in part, hang on, the bureau specifically states that it does not intend to cite an examination or bring an enforcement action against firms who exceed the deadlines to investigate such disputes as long as they make good faith efforts to do so as quickly as possible. It, it sounds like you're saying you are not taking enforcement actions. The data would be consistent with that. Um, what motivated you to issue that guidance? So you're specifically talking about credit reporting, dispute resolution, 
And we had um, and the, res the dispute cannot be resolved if the small business merchant, for example, is actually shuttered and cannot respond to the credit reporting agency. So that's what the good faith effort is about. Absolutely, the mandates to respond remain in place and they need to be met. But there are extenuating circumstances like the closure of a small business, for example, that's a merchant that is the subject of the dispute. I'm pretty sure your job is to protect consumers. What, what, are, you, what are you telling consumers who are sitting there saying, I'm, I, I, I need a response? You've got a 50% surge in consumers, and what are you doing? You're calling them back and saying, I'm sorry, I just can't address this? Figure out how to pay your own rent, figure out how to pay your medical bills, figure out how to pay your car payments? The title of your agency is consumer. Uh, well, Congressman, there are uh, remedies that come after that particular example that I gave you. So it is not acceptable not to respond. And I, just, I noted to Congresswoman Tlaib, as you noted, that we do actually get initial responses in the vast majority of complaints. And on average, it's a nine-day response. Uh, well, but there are responses that take a little longer. Let me just close the way I started. All of us in this hearing, yourself included, are are entrusted with looking after the public interest. When these circumstances arise that are way, way outside of the range of situations that we would encounter, we have an obligation to make sure that we're using, we're adjusting our tools. There's a reason why the captain goes down with the ship, because the captain's got to look over the safety of everyone on the ship. I would hope that you are seriously looking at what your agency can do better, because what you're doing right now is the status quo, which is 80% down from what it was when it was created. I think you know you can do a vastly better job. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Bird, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Director, thanks for uh, being here today. Uh, I wanted to highlight a QFR response I received from your team. Excuse me. Uh, uh, this was. Um, this was received from your team regarding a concern I have with the Bureau's marketing service agreement under RESPA. Now, there's still some need for clarification uh, between me and my team as far as our, what we received, but you did indicate that you were willing to uh, receive some feedback on this. Is it okay if we follow up with you after this uh, on that issue? Absolutely, please do. Okay. Um, I'd also like to uh, ask unanimous consent to submit for the record a recent article on this issue and it was actually authored by your former Deputy Director, Brian Johnson, um, and I'll be sure to share this with your team. Without objection, such is the order. Thank you, Chair. So a few questions, uh, Director. Um, in NPR, for the ability to repay rule, the CFPB encourages stakeholders to develop additional verification standards that the Bureau could incorporate into the QM safe harbor. Given the Bureau's important desire to move away from the static and dated verification standards in the Appendix Q to promote and foster innovation, how can industry and stakeholders help inform and define the Bureau's definition of qualified mortgages? I think uh, I'm very much looking forward to the conversation around the standards because it is a, a critical part of the ability to repay. And, and uh, consider and verify debt and income is what the statute requires. We know that uh, alternate data considerations, for, you know, residual income as opposed to uh, other means of assessing income. And the, we have a challenge in the current appendix Q as well with respect to self-employed or gig economy workers. So understanding how industry has been looking at that, frankly, with input from all stakeholders, it's not just industry, but, but also consumer advocates and others who pay very close attention to what's happening in this space, uh, how we can, again, uh, bring forward creditworthy borrowers who, um, you know, are, are going to have successful loans. That's part of this. So uh, we're very much looking to promote that and and our welcome, uh, welcoming engagement with um, with all stakeholders, frankly, on on what standards they would propose. Thank you. Uh, I want to point to uh, the CFPB's July 10th report on debt settlements and credit counseling. And it's in that you looked at the critical issue of options for consumers who just found out they've got more debt than they can actually handle. In this report, your agency found a rise in debt settlements since 2016, and even more significant increase in settlements that are facilitated by companies that actually charge the consumers to settle those debts for less money than they owe. Now, in my home state, North Carolina, we've seen a rise in complaints about the practices of that industry. 
including misleading advertising, high fees, and that particularly targets the military, which is very concerning to all of us. So I want to encourage you to continue to look into this industry and take all appropriate actions to protect our troops and Americans who could be misled by false promises and high pressure sales tactics from this industry. Any thoughts or follow up on that? Congressman, I would tell you it is an important area. Um, we have taken a number of enforcement actions including with state attorneys general um, uh, against bad actors in this space. Uh, there are clear rules about their ability to collect any fees prior to uh, actually getting the outcome they promised to the consumer. So that's generally where our actions have been taken and we will continue to pursue that. Thank you. So a priority of mine and of also of my uh, committee Republican uh, colleagues here is to eliminate costly and confusing regulations that make it more difficult for businesses to thrive and innovate for the benefit of consumers and markets. Particularly during this pandemic, when we are striving to get our economy back on its feet, it's critical to only promulgate clear, well-founded regulations. And that's why I believe that the failure to change the payment provisions in the small dollar rule will create a patchwork of inconsistent standards or payment provisions based purely on the consumer of the product. Uh, for example, some products will be judged by the standards of NACHA and others by the CFPB rule. And when Federal Reserve an announces a payment standard, that rule will judge yet other products. This is particularly a type of regulatory mess the administration has sought to eliminate. Would it not be better to undertake an appropriate study of the payment provisions rather than to ratify and implement the flawed findings of the 2017 Cordray rule? Congressman, we will uh, undertake a review, of course, five years after the rule is in place and, and take a look at how it is actually implemented. Uh, we did try to, to provide great clarity around which entities and which products are actually you know, pulled into that rule. I know there were some questions about products that clearly were not actually even contemplated in the rule. So we did a lot with guidance on that. Thank that you. Great. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Utah, Mr. McAdams, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair and Director Craninger. When you first appeared before this committee last March, we had a discussion then about balancing access to credit while at the same time ensuring that consumers are protected from harmful products. Specifically, I asked about CFPB's planned actions on its payday rule, and I expressed my concern that payday products can quickly become debt traps, especially if a lender doesn't ensure that the borrower has the ability to pay. And you noted that it was a proposal at the time and you would continue to review your consumer protection mission as you undertook the rulemaking. So earlier this month, you issued, issued a final rule that repeals the requirement that lenders determine a borrower's ability to repay those loans before making them. So I'd like to ask you again, what role does consumer protection play as you undertook and finalized this rulemaking? So, Congressman, the mandatory underwriting provisions were very specific. So I, I recognize they're frequently referred to as ability to repay, but there were specific stipulations there uh, that, that would be particularly challenging. Again, by the Bureau's own estimation, it would uh, have a significant uh, reduction in the availability of credit there. So that was something that we looked yeah, at. Yeah, I would just say from my perspective, it, it seems like you just made it much easier to have consumers get trapped in that cycle of debt uh, that they would be cycling through over and over again. And I worry this rulemaking sacrifices reasonable consumer protections. And I know it's a balance, but it seems like the balance uh, was, is against the consumers. And as I understand it, part of your assertion for repealing the mandatory underwriting provisions is due to what you claim is insufficient research that went into the 2017 rule. Is that correct? Yes, Congressman, as okay. well as the legal uh, reasoning that was in that rule. So I would like to read you a footnote in your rulemaking from this month. It's footnote 343 buried on page 177 or 171 of the PDF. And it says, Consumer protection issues have arisen and will continue to arise in the payday market, as in other markets, as a result of a given lender's specific practices. And the Bureau is prepared to address those issues, for example, through supervision and enforcement against deceptive claims in advertising or marketing for payday loans. So you've acknowledged in your own rule that there are consumer protection problems in the payday industry. And I, I would ask, is, is your contention that supervision and enforcement are sufficient tools to keep consumers safe? 
Congressman, they're certainly part of the protections that are in uh, this space as in others. I have, I have contended that there are bad actors in every market space, sure. including this one. Sure. So they're a key part of it. I'd also say that we are doing work on disclosures because I think there are there's great evidence in those rulemakings that there are consumers who well understand the products and there might be some who don't quite understand the products when they actually get them. And that's something we want to look into uh, and are doing disclosure testing on. So it's another example of another protection uh, in addition to the payments provisions and supervision and enforcement. Thank you. Well, I think if we are putting a lot of stock in supervision and enforcement as our means of protecting consumers in this regard, I'd like to see what your plans are for beefed up supervision and enforcement plans. And if not, do you intend to study the issue to put together sufficient research and pursue regulations that actually do keep consumers safe, which is the mission of the CFPB? I am committed to constant uh, review of the rules. We have five-year look-back requirements by Congress that I think were incredibly, uh, there's a lot of foresight in those. So we will de definitely do that on this rule uh, as we do on others, for example. But any uh, feedback based on what is happening in the marketplace needs to inform the way we operate. But as it stands right now, even though you acknowledge that there are consumer protection issues, you are not looking for any additional tools that would help to protect consumers in, in regards of this debt trap in, in payday loans. Um, our disclosure testing would represent that. Uh, I'd also note increased competition is part of what we are seeking, and we have been working through our innovation policies to get banks uh, and credit unions to, uh, to offer responsible products in this space, too. Okay. Well, I would like to see what research uh, was used to base that conclusion that that would be adequate and sufficient for consumer protections. Lastly, um, and we're about out of time, so maybe we'll just have this submit this in a written form, but uh, on Friday, the CFPB announced that it plans to release an advance notice of proposed rulemaking on consumer authorized access to financial records. This is a topic that this committee has explored before, and it's of great interest to consumers, to financial institutions, and to fintech companies. So I'd love for you to elaborate on the CFPB initiative and what the Bureau's goals are with the ANPR and rulemaking process. And I do see that we're out of time, so we can take that outside of this forum, but thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Kustoff, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for convening today's hearing. Director, thank you for appearing today. I could, I'd like to follow up on Congressman Budd's question uh, towards the end of his questioning. I know about three weeks ago, you, you did finalize the, the final rule as it relates to uh, 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 these payments and the small dollar lenders. So the rule uh, that you promulgated three weeks ago or so uh, kept in place the 2017 rule provision that imposed, frankly, a restrictive requirement by allowing just one representment of a returned ACH payment. And it also extended the representment limit to transactions not covered by the by the NACHA rules. So my my first question is, is there a disparity uh, in in that that the NACHA rules shouldn't be applied to all lenders? Congressman, we were starting with the, the rulemaking we had uh, in in place. Um, and so the the mandatory underwriting provisions were the ones that had, that had the significant impact on the availability of credit, as well as the issues that uh, we've been discussing here today. And so it, the, the insufficiency of the evidence and, and legal reasoning that underpinned that part of the rule. So that is where the reconsideration came into play. Uh, it was my judgment that the payments provisions, again, uh, should continue, that we can see how that uh, is implemented. And as I just said to Congressman McAdams, too, we can, we can certainly look at what happens and if there are unintended effects to it. Uh, we did also put out some very clear guidance to try to stipulate what products are affected and what are not. Uh, and I, I appreciate the point you're raising, I, the, the rulemaking that uh, was promulgated. And so that's the, the process we engaged in. All right, let, me, let me ask it another way. Doesn't the final rule create more burdensome regulations for just some covered lenders? Uh, it does only affect certain lenders. That is that is very true, and um, that was certainly by by design of the rule. Uh, and we will certainly take into account what uh, impacts that has when that is able to be implemented. All right. 
are there plans to are there plans to revise the payment provisions in the future or is it your position you have to wait five years uh, Congressman, I, I certainly respond to things that we see in the market. So if, if we get evidence sooner uh, that is, there is an issue that needs to be dealt with, uh, I would be certainly happy to consider that. Thank you, Director. If I can, I was reading a uh, report from Yahoo Money last week. It talked about one in four Americans with credit cards said that they had an account involuntarily shut down during the span of May to July. And specifically we're talking about, or the article talked about uh, those consumers with uh, FICO scores uh, between 550 and, and 700. I, I think the, that article said that they're roughly, that roughly covers about 60 million Americans. Uh, so I think we all know that the credit card for so many Americans, it's uh, not just a lifeline, it's a, it's a necessity. Are there any steps that the CFPB is taking? And I'm, again, I'm talking about specifically for those consumers in the uh, 550 to 700 credit scores so that they don't lose their credit cards due to the pandemic. Congressman, you're raising an important issue. I'm, I'm certainly aware of credit limit changes and certain uh, cards that don't have activity on them, but I was not aware of the article you just cited, so I'm happy to take a look at it and see um, precisely what happened there and, and what action we should take. Thank you, Director. And with that, I yield back the remainder of my time. The gentleman from Virginia, the gentlewoman from Virginia, Ms. Wexton is recognized for five minutes. Okay. She needs to unmute. Ms. Wexton, please unmute. Okay, now I've got it. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Director Craninger, for joining us today. Now, Director Craninger, I did read your extended testimony, and in 14 pages, I saw just one reference to the Paycheck Protection Program, which I'm sure is something that you guys are, are very much involved in at this time, as it's such a timely uh, program and doing so much work here in, in our country. Um, and you do have a role in supervising the implementation of that program, do you not? Only a narrow slice of that, certainly with respect to the Equal Credit Opportunity Act compliance by covered lenders. Right. So you do have to manage and make sure that that you have to assess the compliance of lenders with fair lending with fair lending laws, right? Uh, yes, with ECOA, yes. Are those assessments taking place? And what have you found about Paycheck Protection Program loans? So we are engaged in what we're calling prioritized assessments, so very targeted exams of uh, entities with respect to what's happening right now. And we did include small business lending, ECOA compliance as part of that effort. Uh, so we are engaged in that now. So let me ask you, just if you, even if you can just ballpark it, what percentage of Paycheck Protection Program loans went to minority-owned small businesses? Uh, Congresswoman, off the top of my head, I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. I do know it's an area that, uh, again, I, I am interested in generally that the administration has been interested in promoting, and we've done a lot of outreach to uh, try to uh, expand that uh, availability. So I don't suppose that you can, you can ballpark what percentage of paycheck protection loans went to women-owned small businesses either? No, I cannot. Okay. Well, an inspector general report from May criticized the SBA for not requiring applicants to submit, submit demographic data. I'm, I'm sure you're aware of that. And my colleagues and I have repeatedly called on the SBA and Treasury, Treasury to collect this information on loan or the loan forgiveness application and make it mandatory. But so far, it's only being collected on a voluntary basis. And that's concerning because in my district, we, we performed an assessment of our own of those applications put out there in, uh, in Virginia 10. And in my district, 95% did not provide the race or ethnicity data, and 83% did not provide gender ownership. So, Director Craninger, it's probably a lot harder for you to do your job if you don't have the information 
to de demographic as, uh, data to do your assessment with. Is that correct? Well, there, there were certainly other issues at play with trying to move quickly and get this program running. No, I, so I, I, will, I will say, I get that, reclaiming my time. I understand that, that time was of the essence and everything, but it's hard for you to do your job if you don't have the data. I think you can agree about that. I know you don't work for the SBA or Treasury. Well, I guess it's a little bit Treasury, but, but you, have you communicated with them about their decision not to require demographic data for collection of Paycheck Protection Program pro, uh, on either the application or the forgiveness application? Have you communicated with them? That, that we, makes we have hard? We have talked about the data that is available in terms of uh, what the reach of the program has been and the, uh, you know, the extensive number of small businesses that it has helped. Uh, we, we are continuing to look at how we can promote, again, access, which is the core of your question and certainly the core of my interest uh, and, and understanding that better. And that's part of why we engage in the prioritized assessment. How are we going to know what kind of access has been provided when 95% when of the people, at least in my district, aren't even answering the question. So that makes it very difficult. Now you are responsible for implementing section 1071 of Dodd-Frank, right? Yes. And that does require that, that lenders collect and maintain information about loan applications by women-owned, minority-owned, and small businesses. And that requires the CFPB to collect and publish that information. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. But your leaders, your leadership under the the bureau under your leadership has slow walked the implementation of this section. And in February of this year, you settled a lawsuit seeking to compel you to implement the law. Is that correct? Uh, no, that's actually false. Uh, I committed during my confirmation process that that was a statutorily required regulation, and I was committed to implementing it. And I actually announced that in the regulatory agenda prior to the filing of the lawsuit. But you entered, but you entered into a settlement that had court court ordered implementation deadlines. Is that correct? That is correct. And have you started the rulemaking process? Yes, we will issue a Sabrifa outline, which is the small business regulatory relief process uh, outline by September fifteenth, and engage in that part of the regulatory process this fall. And you commit to 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 meet your deadlines under this section. Uh, yes, that's the only deadline at this time. Thank you. The gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Hollingsworth, is recognized for five minutes. Hi, good afternoon, Dr. Kraninger. Thank you for being here, and thank you for your continued work at the CFPB. I'm sure at times today, a quarter of an inch of plexiglass hasn't seemed like enough protection. I wanted to step back and talk more generally for a second about some of the larger dynamics at play in our economy and certainly at the CFPB as well. You recently published a blog post, or I should say the CFPB generally recently published a blog post about the use of AI and ML um, increasing in financial protection laws. I wondered if you might venture into, or do you intend to do more in this space? What might that look like? What are you trying to balance in terms of your next actions in that space? That's a, a, gr a great question. I think what we were seeking to do with the um, look that we've done at AI and ML and also alternative data in underwriting is the uh, recognition that there is great opportunity there in terms of expansion of access. Uh, particularly for underbanked, unbanked individuals who have not been reached before. Um, so taking that information into account. There's also some risk introduced in that process, again, so understanding it. So we're continuing to look at how lenders are approaching that, uh, looking at what innovations they're bringing. Our innovation policies are an opportunity for them to engage with us and look at a, either a sandbox policy or a no action letter policy to have a more robust conversation about that and, and then have data from uh, actual operations by an actual uh, lender or, or creditor to base any you know, additional action on. Uh, we're certainly looking at it uh, with respect to our supervisory activity, enforcement activity too, uh, but, but I think largely it's, it's making sure we have experts inside who understand how it works, understand how industry is seeking to apply it, uh, and looking at how that is uh, hopefully being beneficial to employ uh, to consumers and taking action uh, where it is not. 
Yeah, Director Kraninger, I think that is extremely well said. There are tremendous opportunities. There are also limitations of the technology, certainly, but tremendous opportunities to increase inclusion in the financial sector and empower Americans in our district and many other districts across the country to be able to live better lives and achieve their American dream. And I think you would agree with this, but to hear you say it, it sounded like you also said there are real costs to retarding innovation in this country, retarding financial inclusion in this country to families, their lives, their futures. Is that true? Uh, yes, I yeah. do see that. And something that you will weigh as you continue to think about, A, what that sandbox might look like, how we increase perhaps the pace of innovation while also recognizing the safety that needs to go into place as well. Yes. Right. Second question, again, generally, I know uh, my friend across the aisle, Ms. Wexton, um, Mitch touched on prioritized assessments. I wondered if you might talk a little bit about what you've learned in some of that, about how our financial institutions have been able to serve their customers, help their customers, empower their customers during the course of the last four months. Yeah, that is certainly what I expect to find in the vast majority of the prioritized assessments is, is precisely that and understanding, um, getting, again, some, some more information about how that is going, what practices uh, are successful for consumers, and what activities are, or what challenges are those institutions facing in, in trying to help uh, their, their customers. And I'm sure so not we don't have much at the, at the moment, but we're literally uh, in the midst of it right now. Right. I'm sure not all of their challenges are policy related, but some of them may be policy related, regulatory related, to ensure that they have the flexibility to be able to serve those customers, not just during more ordinary times, perhaps, more ordinary circumstances, but also the flexibility to address their customers' needs during extraordinary circumstances as well. So providing some of that latitude and flexibility, I imagine, will be an important learning point going forward, right? Yes, definitely. Great. And then in addition to that, I wanted to ask about further coordination in some of these exams done by multiple agencies and making sure that a company or an institution is providing that information as few times as possible and as disseminated as widely as possible as needed, not overly disseminated, by the way, within the reaches of the federal government. Yes, that is something that uh, has been a focal point for me as the chair of the FFIEC, where we're coming together and coordinating on exams. Um, despite the challenges of the pandemic and other priorities that, that do supersede this, we have a continued um, activity going on around common technology and common data collection and sharing. So that is that is still happening. Uh, we're still looking to make some progress on that. Right. Obviously, institutions are rightfully concerned about the proliferation of hours that are being used in submitting to exams, which they are ready and willing to do, but also want to make sure it's coordinated and done as efficiently as expected so that they can spend their time serving, helping, empowering those customers. And with that, I'll yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Massachusetts. Mr. Lynch is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, for having this hearing, and uh, thank you, Director Kreninger, for appearing and helping us with our work. Uh, Director, last week, uh, CFPB announced an advanced notice of a proposed rulemaking around uh, Section 1033 of Dodd-Frank, which obviously deals with the consumer authorization of access to financial data and records. Uh, we recently had a hearing on this issue and I'm following up on, on Mr. Davidson's concerns. Uh, we recently had a hearing on this issue in the Financial Services FinTech Task Force. And the concerns were largely in two areas and they were bipartisan. Uh, first of all, people were concerned about uh, members were concerned about uh, the the full spectrum gathering of data from consumers and whether that happens from screen scraping, which you mentioned, or web scraping, content scraping, or whether it's telematics. You know, right now through our cell phones and and other technology, uh, financial firms and others know everything about our lives, who we are with, where we travel, how fast we drive. Uh, and those tools can be used to discriminate. We've seen uh, in some instance where individuals who live in a certain census tract uh, were, were discriminated against because they lived in a, a low income or in public housing. Uh, so that was one concern about the use of that data and the practice of screen scraping in particular. The other issue was 
the consent form, the so-called consumer consent. And, uh, you know, you've got a 19 page uh, uh, consent form that basically, you know, the, the application administrator requires you to sign off on this 19 page item that even as an attorney, I had a difficult time uh, understanding and that's for regular consumers. So two questions. One, uh, where are we on screen scraping? Uh, you mentioned we're moving away from screen scraping in your earlier comments, but we've been moving away for over a year. We're just not moving that fast. And secondly, the issue of those consent forms, uh, are you thinking in this rulemaking that you'll you'll address both of those aspects? And uh, I, I just love to get your, your insights and your thoughts on both of those issues. Thank you. Now, thank you, Congressman. I'm, I'm glad you all had the opportunity to talk about that and, and take advantage of that ourselves. We had our symposium where these issues came up and, and the, the uh, purpose of the advance notice proposed rulemaking is to really formalize that data gathering and think about what might be needed in a rulemaking and what would make sense. But the two issues you raise are important ones, certainly. Um, one with respect to, um, you know, what kinds of data is actually available and, and how it gets used, and then certainly what consumers um, know about the data that they have permissioned and how it's going to be used. And the um, disclosure aspect of this, the consent process that you noted is one that's of concern to me since I've been in this position, and, and we're going to make some progress on trying to do better disclosures and, and give people the key information they need rather than giving them legal ease that um, that they just end up checking the box on. So that is that is a huge, uh, I think, concern on many fronts. Um, I, with risk, oh, please, go ahead. No, just uh, on screen, you started to address that earlier, but uh, you, you were cut off. Oh, yeah, so with respect to, to screen scraping, uh, the the, uh, the we of course is is the marketplace at this point in time. Uh, the bureau certainly would intervene in in uh, UDAP circumstance or other compliance issue, but the market really is moving away from that. So the uh, there have been a number of agreements on API means of sharing that are making progress, and some real deadlines from financial institutions insisting on APIs uh, or shutting off access. I won't comment, frankly, on. There, there are issues with that for sure uh, on both sides, um, but I, I do think there's been progress, actual progress made um, to reduce the screen scraping. So that's in the marketplace generally. And what about the length and complexity of these consent forms? Yeah. Uh, that That is a concern area. It's something that we will take feedback on and see uh, what we can uh, what we can do about that or what what would require rulemaking, what might be able to be addressed in other ways. Um, so that's what that's what the ANPR will do. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Gonzalez, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Director Kraninger, for being here today and for your continued service to the country. Uh, I applaud you and your staff for continuing to work on, on behalf of our country during the pandemic. It's not easy for anybody, and, and uh, you all have uh, performed well, so uh, thank you for that. Um, as you know, there's, there's growing evidence that one of the best things regulators could do to expand credit access is to make it clear that lenders are allowed to use new underwriting techniques that leverage alternative kinds of data. Uh, Colin, uh, no, Mr. Hollingsworth referenced this as well. Uh, traditional credit scores are generally good predictors of risk for people who have high scores, but they don't work for people with little or no credit history. Uh, not for many people who are credit worthy, but have lower credit scores due to complex factors that the scoring process does not capture. Uh, FinTechs and some banks have been innovating in use of non-score factors uh, now that it's easy to capture new kinds of data and can be analyzed with techniques like machine learning. Research by the nonprofit FinReg Lab and others supports the argument that these met methods are predictive of risk. However, the industry, especially banks, uh, have hesitated to adopt the methods because of concerns about regulatory criticism and especially the potential to run afoul of the prohibition against unintentional discriminatory disparate impact. Uh, you and other regulators have issued joint encouragement that lenders consider these new methods but have not yet offered clarity on how to do so in ways that regulators uh, consider inside a green zone on disparate impact. 
Um, first question, do you see this innovation as a high impact way to expand credit access? I think the answer is yes. You sort of elaborated already, um, but just to say it again. Yes, uh, yes Great. I do. And then um, what plans are you currently working on to clarify the rules of the road to encourage faster adoption here? So, Congressman, I, I'd point to, particularly to our innovation policies, um, having that opportunity to have engagement with an entity, uh, understand the product, they have to provide the benefits that they see to the product, to, of the product to consumers, uh, the risks that they see, the way they're mitigating those risks, and what regulatory issue is is a barrier or is a challenge, um, and we can have that dialogue about that product and be very specific about um, the ability to move forward with that product with guardrails. Um, so that's that's certainly the the top avenue. We are looking at you know what additional guidance would be useful. We've issued guidance on alternative data. We did on AI and ML use uh, in underwriting. And I think we're um, you know, very open to that in terms of the conversation. I did issue a request for information uh, just uh, two days ago on the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. And it did specifically ask about uh, alternative data and other issues that um, might be uh, posing challenges uh, yeah. to entities or where we think there might be opportunities. So response to that is also uh, could lead to, to different action. Thank you. And then is there anything that we can provide at the congressional level that, that would empower you even more to sort of help set up the guardrails here and other regulators generally? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Congressman, I don't have anything at the moment that I, I would seek or suggest, um, but, but appreciate the, um, the question and, and we'll certainly let you know if, if we do find something that would be useful. Okay, thank you. Because I think, uh, like a lot of my colleagues, um, you know, my, one of my biggest fears coming out of this pandemic is and you can just see this looking at what's happening in the markets for very wealthy people or people in the upper income scale. It's, it's inconvenient, but not financially devastating, um, certainly not. Uh, for people who are lower income, especially minority communities, absolutely devastating, uh, setting them back even further. Um, and so I see alternative data sources and different ways of expanding access to credit as one of the most important things we can do because people are going to have to rebuild their lives. Um, and, and we have to provide them with all the opportunities necessary to do that. So um, I'd encourage you to, to keep that work alive uh, and, and to keep, keep uh, interacting with us if we can provide help because people are going to need it. Um, so with that, I yield back. Thank you. The gentlewoman from North Carolina, Mrs. Adams, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Waters, for convening today's hearing. Uh, thank you, Director uh, Carringer, for being here. Um, I wanted to ask a few questions regarding uh, predatory debt uh, settlement companies um, and the harmful uh, settlement activities that are happening in my state, uh, likely that are likely also happening across the country. Uh, in North Carolina, we've seen a rise in complaints about the practices of this industry, including misleading advertising, high fees, uh, particularly uh, from the military and their families. I've gotten letters from high-ranking officials at Camp Lejeune and Fort Bragg in North Carolina, uh, from uh, one of our largest credit unions, the State Employees Credit Union. Uh, so yes or no, have you heard of a company called Freedom Debt Relief or Freedom Financial Network? I have not heard of those those companies specifically, Congresswoman. Okay. What about are you? So, so you're not aware then of their business model or predatory practices? Then, if you if you if you're not, it's one of the largest. I will say that the the concerning practices by some debt settlement companies is is definitely something that I am aware of, and we have engaged in enforcement actions. I believe with the state of North Carolina, with the Attorney General of North Carolina, I believe he was uh, a party to that, uh, to one of those cases. So it is, there are concerning practices happening there and we are taking enforcement action. Well, thank you. But you know, the, the, CD, the CFPB under um, uh, Mr. Mulvaney uh, brought an action against the, the Freedom Debt Relief and secured about $20 million in restitution, $5 million in damages, 
uh, violated the law by charging customers or consumers without settling their debts as promised. Uh, but are you aware uh, that uh, the CFPB uh, uh, entered a consent order with the Freedom Financial uh, Service after the agency filed this complaint? Congressman, I do apologize that I don't remember that particular case, but I, I stipulate that you are probably right. Okay. Let me ask you, if do you believe that it helps consumers when debt settlement companies encourage customers to, uh, consume, customer borrowers to deliberately default on credit card debt? Do you think that helps consumers when they do that? Yes or no? Uh, no, I, these, there are many concerning practices in the debt settlement space, um, there's no doubt. So we, we are certainly paying very close attention to that and taking action. They cannot ex, you know, ex, accept fees when they have not actually provided the results and there's a requirement to actually do that several months after uh, the outcome they promised has been delivered. Okay. You know, in, in this time of, of COVID uh, with an economy that's hurting, it's, it's very likely that our constituents uh, will find themselves saddled with more debt. So I want to know uh, what you and the CFPB will do to protect American consumers and our military from being misled by false promises and high pressure sales tactics uh, from the for-profit debt settlement industry, because they're really leaning hard on these folks. So I, I agree with you. It is a concerning area. I can say we're also working with the Department of Defense. In addition to all of our enforcement actions, uh, we are working to make sure we get information to those military personnel, uh, to consumers generally about um, being cautious in the debt settlement space, uh, and frankly, pointing them also to nonprofit entities where um, they would get the support that they may need. So let me ask you, uh, in terms of smaller lenders, uh, they are probably finding it more difficult to compete in this kind of environment. Several industry groups and consumer advocate organizations have also expressed concern that a pricing-based definition could result in, in a race to the bottom. Uh, based on the Bureau's own recognition that pricing can be manipulated, the uh, proposed qualified mortgage standard does not appear to be an effective measure, measure of a borrower's ability uh, to repay. So how will you ensure that a pricing-based uh, um, qualified mortgage does not incentivize irresponsible mortgage lending, similar to what we witnessed in the lead-up to the 2008 financial crisis? Yeah, Congressman, I appreciate the question. It's an important one. The statutory uh, features that are precluded from being part of a qualified mortgage, um, that is um, that continues. In addition, a requirement to actually consider and verify debt and income is part of the part of the law. So. All right. Thanks very much. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. The gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Rose, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Waters and Ranking Member McHenry for holding this hearing, and thank you, Director Craniger, for appearing before us today. I'd like to jump right into the CFPB's recently finalized small dollar lending rule. The Bureau has previously acknowledged the key role that small dollar loans can play in helping consumers meet credit needs, usually resulting from unexpected expenses. At the beginning of this month, the Bureau took a step in the right direction by rescinding the mandatory underwriting provisions of the Obama era small dollar lending rule. However, like several of my colleagues, I am very disappointed that the CFB, CFPB uh, chose to leave the payment provisions of the original rule intact. Much like the ability to repay provision, the Bureau's own evidence didn't support its payment practices provisions. They were flawed and based on unsupported data. It also imposes onerous requirements that could make it all but impossible for consumers to use recurring payments. I want to get a real answer to this question, Director Kraniger. Please explain to me why you kept this particular provision in place, choosing to enforce an Obama era rule requiring overly burdensome compliance. Uh, Congressman, I recognize that that is an important uh, issue for you. It's been raised by many members. Uh, first and foremost, it was the reconsideration of the mandatory underwriting provisions that really were 
um, the focal point given the dramatic impact that that would have on the availability of credit in this space. So that, that was the priority. Uh, with respect to the payments provisions, it was also uh, a, a recognition that there is some consumer protection in there with respect to uh, certain products. I, I recognize there were also concerns about how broad this may be applying, and we did issue uh, additional guidance uh, when we issued the final rule that laid out the types of products that are covered, are not covered uh, under this rule uh, to try to address some of those issues. And the last thing I would say that I have not mentioned earlier is that we're still in litigation over uh, over these provisions. So that is that is still ongoing. Since we last spoke about this, I know you were looking again at this provision. However, it remained in the final rule published on July 7th. How long are lenders given uh, how long will lenders be given to comply with this payment provision? So because of the litigation, the, the rule is still stayed. Uh, the Bureau is uh, going is seeking to uh, propose to the, to the court that it lifted after a reasonable period of time. Uh, since we have not done that filing, I can't tell you here what the reasonable period of time is, but that would be my intention. And that filing should happen relatively soon. So we can answer that question for you relatively soon. So once that filing occurs, would you expect it to be 60 days from that time? Uh, I, I am looking at a reasonable period of time, and I can't tell you right now precisely what that, what that will be, but we'll, we'll get back to you. Keeping this provision in place will cause, in my view, an undue compliance burden on financial institutions and payment processors. Ultimately, the end result will be that responsible lenders unable to manage and mitigate the risk will choose to de-risk and quit or not form relationships with companies offering covered loans, increasing the cost of these products to the consumers that need them. This will also drive the small dollar lending market back to the storefront payday lenders, putting us in the position of picking winners and losers. Moving forward, I believe it is crucial that we maintain consistent payment system rules, which are grounded in associated laws and regulations. And I urge you and the CFPB to revisit this finalized rule and roll back the payment provisions created by the 2017 small dollar lending rule. In my remaining time, um, I want to just uh, turn to another issue. Back in January 2017, uh, under Director Cordray, the CFPB filed a suit in federal court alleging that hundreds of thousands of student loan borrowers have been harmed by steering borrowers away from income-driven repayment and toward costlier options. In nearly four years, how many borrowers have been proven to have been steered? Congressman, that's ongoing litigation and obviously in the midst of, of discovery and other parts of that process there. So I, I can't answer that question for you, but I, I understand why it's important. I am very concerned that this ongoing litigation that you describe without discovering any evidence is a bad use of taxpayers' dollars. And I am concerned that the CFPB is dragging out cases like this in search of a problem in order to justify the sunk costs that have already been incurred. I hope this practice does not continue. With that, Madam Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Garcia, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, um, Madam Chair and uh, Ranking uh, Member uh, for convening this hearing, and thank you, uh, Director Kenninger, for joining us today. Congress passed Dodd-Frank and authorized the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau 10 years ago this month. In 2010, our country faced high unemployment, millions of people lost their homes to eviction and foreclosures. My community was hit hard by the last financial crisis, and many people never recovered. And now COVID-19 crisis has left my constituents piled with housing debt, medical debt, credit card debt, and who knows when they'll get back on their feet to pay it off. That's why the CFPB was established during the last crisis to give ordinary people like my neighbors in Chicago their own voice against big banks, against mortgage lenders, against debt collectors. But that's not what we see uh, from watching the Bureau today during a nationwide pandemic, when we have no idea when jobs can come back and consumers have no idea how they're going to pay off their debt, the CFPB has been working for the industry instead of the public. Gutting the payday lending rule earlier this month is a scary example. Cutting the payday 
I, mean, I represent a working class immigrant district. There are a lot of payday lenders in my district as lobbyists always like to point out. The CSP, this is a question for you. The CSPB's new rule eliminated the requirement that lenders ensure that the borrowers can pay the loan back. This means that a lender can now make a loan when they know that a borrower cannot pay it back. Director Conninger, do you think that a lender should make a loan to a customer if they know that they cannot pay it back? Congressman, the mandatory underwriting provisions of the small dollar rule uh, had- Can you give me a yes or no answer, Director? I'll just say the small dollar space is, is a little bit different and that ability to- Should they make such a loan if they know that it can't be paid back? Congressman, I appreciate the principle. Okay, you won't answer that. Are you worried about trapping customers in a cycle of debt that they aren't able to repay? Congressman, again, I appreciate the principle you're trying to establish. This is a complex area. In Are you concerned dollars. about that? I absolutely want to make sure that consumers understand the products that Are they you are concerned engaged. about it? I want consumers to understand the products that they're Maybe, engaged in, and I want or them not. to have options. Let's move on if you don't want to answer those two questions. The Military Lending Act protects our service members from getting trapped in a cycle of debt by setting a 36% interest rate cap on their consumer finance products. I introduced the Bipartisan Veterans and Consumers Fair Credit Act to extend the cap to all consumers so that all of my constituents enjoy that protection. Do you support the 36% interest rate cap currently in effect under the Military Lending Act? Uh, it is current law, uh, Congressman, so that is- Do you support it? I, I don't have a role in, in uh, examining that, but certainly we enforce it. Do you think that the rate cap helps service members avoid being trapped in a cycle of debt? Congressman, I believe that Congress put that in place for a reason that's outlined in the- Do you think it helps running. them? Your opinion, not Congress's. Undecided. Okay, my last one. Director, some of my colleagues across the aisle seem to be mistaken by the recent Supreme Court decision in Sela Law versus CFPB. I want to clarify that the Supreme Court did not rule that the CFPB itself was unconstitutional, but that only the requirements needed to remove the director was unconstitutional. So my question is, does this case in any way limit your authority or ability to protect consumers moving forward? I continue to carry out what the Dodd-Frank Act empowered me to carry out, which is protecting consumers. So I, I think at this point I would say no. Okay, thank you. Uh, I yield the rest of my time, Madam Chair. The gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. Mooney, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so for preface, I'm not a lawyer myself, but a lot of businesses and individuals have needed good lawyers when uh, they need to exercise their legal rights. And in many cases, that's when money's owed to them. Uh, there's, they lended money in a fair contract, it's owed back to them, and it's not getting paid back, which prevents the lender from paying their bills, employing more people, putting food on their table. So uh, for hundreds of years, attorneys have been regulated and disciplined primarily by state Supreme Courts that license them and by the state court judges, not by the federal agencies. I feel that the proposed rule change from the CFPB on debt collection could jeopardize this norm. The CFPB safe harbor proposal to codify the meaningful attorney involvement doctrine is intended to clarify regulation for creditor attorneys, but I fear it would do exactly the opposite. Uh, the meaningful attorney involvement doctrine appears nowhere in the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act or the Dodd-Frank Act. Uh, the concept has gone far beyond the statute, creates uncertainty and confusion uh, over the rules regulating attorneys. So Director uh, Carringer, I fear that the CFBB's proposed safe harbor rule for meaningful attorney involvement in debt collection uh, could lead to a, the codification of meaningful attorney involvement doctrine, bring further uncertainty. The American Bar Association and the National Creditors Bar Association have both stated their opposition 
to the safe harbor provision in this rule. Um, would you be open to reconsidering the proposed safe harbor rule for meaningful attorney involvement? So it is a proposed rule, Congressman. So I, I actually have not heard of those organizations' opposition, but I imagine that I will hear it soon because we're going through all of the comments now. Uh, we did get thousands of comments on this rulemaking. And um, as it comes forward to me in terms of recommendations and decisions, I absolutely will uh, take those comments okay. into account. Well, since the, you know, thank you for that. Uh, since the founding of our country up until CFPB was created, the legal process has worked well. Uh, people may not, not always get the results they, they, they want, but they have legal representation, and they have a fair hearing, and it's regulated by the courts, and if you do something wrong, you get disbarred. We've all heard of lawyers who have been unethical and gotten disbarred. You have a working process. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. So uh, I'm glad to hear you know, uh, that, that you want to do that. I had a bipartisan bill I introduced myself last Congress called the Practice of Law Technical Clarification Act, which have amend, would have amended the Fair Debt Collection Practice to exclude law firms and licensed attorneys engaged in litigation from the definition of debt collector. Had it passed, it would have made it absolutely clear that licensed attorneys are regulated by the courts, not federal regulatory bodies. Um, but thank you for your answers, and uh, Madam Chair, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Garcia, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you uh, for being with us today, uh, Director. I know it's been a long day, but we're down to the final stretch. Uh, first, I want to thank you. I want to thank you because uh, back in March of last year when you first came by, I mentioned to you my concerns about protecting those with limited English proficiency. Uh, that is a real um, concern in my district, which is predominantly Latino, about 77%. And I've seen your Spanish language COVID-related outreach, and I really do appreciate that, so thank you. However, there is so much more work to be done, not just in outreach, but in enforcement. You mentioned this issue in your oral testimony, but it is not mentioned in your written testimony, and only once in the agency's spring report. I would like the agency to devote additional resources in this area. How is your agency working to target unfair practices that target the limited English proficiency community. Yeah, thank you, Congresswoman, for that question. And, and um, we, we have a lot of sources for the enforcement actions that we take. Certainly whistleblowers come forward um, that we use the complaints. Um, so encouraging communities, and it, we have many communities we still need to continue to reach so they know about us. But when they do submit complaints, we take those seriously. We look for any patterns or practices. We go in and do examinations based on that or go straight to an enforcement action. So there are a lot of ways. So how that many times have you gone to an enforcement action? Um, we have, we have uh, hundreds of ongoing uh, investigations and many no, other. But how many times have you taken an enforcement action? I've, there are public, 40 public enforcement actions that I've taken in my term to date. And how many of those were, were based on targeting, any targeting of, of um, un, unfair practices against English proficiency uh, consumers? I will admit to you that I do not recall there being an LEP nexus to these cases, um, but that doesn't mean we don't have other work that we okay, are doing could in we that just, area. Could you, can, can I hear from you a commitment to be more vigilant about that? I, yes, Congresswoman, I would, I would pledge to, if there are um, particular entities that your constituents are interacting with where, you know, you've heard issues, um, raising them to us, we would be happy to, okay. uh, to take that into account too. All right, well, I'm gonna to switch topics now. I'm tremendously upset, tremendously upset by your agency's recent action to allow paid in lenders to continue to prey of the, for, on those most in need. You've testified that the previous rule would have reduced access to credit by 70%, and that is why you changed this rule, correct? Uh, yes, that is certainly one reason. All right, but what I don't think you understand is that paid in loans aren't credit. They are chains of debt, a cycle of debt and traps, as some of my colleagues have have uh, described, there are tools that extract wealth from the most vulnerable. This isn't just my opinion, this is something we all know to be true. That's why Congress enacted the Military Lending Act nearly 15 years ago, to protect our service members from being trapped in a cycle of debt. It was such a concern that the Department of Defense was beginning to see the impact to military readiness. Mr. McHenry calls these products a lifeline. 
And that's what people are looking for when they seek out a payday loan. They are seeking a lifeline. But instead, they are being thrown an anchor by these predatory companies. In the, the, if the military felt that these institutions were degrading the readiness of our military personnel, imagine what these predators are doing to the very fabric of our society. Predatory payday lenders extract wealth from poor and minority communities. They perpetrate the racial wealth gap. They are part of a system that has let inequity grow and wealth accumulate to the very few, while leaving those in my community struggling just to maintain. I've always said that payday lenders just make poor people poorer. I'm afraid that your actions have made you an enabler. And I am just really distressed and concerned uh, that you've taken the recent action. Finally, one last topic. I want to talk about the stimulus checks. This spring, Treasury sent out about 159 million checks. 159, that's a lot of people. There was a lot of concern about some of the calls some of our, our constituents were getting, people saying, hey, we can get you the check, but you know, there's gonna be a fee, you know, we're gonna take 10%. You know, knowing that there's been some fraud and some issues with stimulus checks, uh, and knowing that we're looking at another round through this relief pack package, what are you doing to help prevent some of these scams from reoccurring? Oh, Congressman, that's that's an important question. Uh, I, I know I'm limited here. I, we are already talking to Treasury about that, and we were with them from day one trying to, as soon as they made a policy decision about how to distribute the funds, how do we communicate about that and reach people? All right, thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Steele, Steele is uh, recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Chairwoman, and thank you, uh, Director, for being with us today. Uh, as several members have mentioned, the Supreme Court finally confirmed what many of us have been arguing for years, that the leadership structure at the CFPB was unconstitutional, and this, to me, though, is just this, to me, though, is just one of the structural problems with the agency that was seemingly built to be unaccountable. That's not a comment to you. That's a comment to us in the House of Representatives, in the United States Senate, that structured it to be that way, to be unaccountable. And one of my big frustrations is, the, is that the Bureau is set up in, to be regulated and to put forward regulation by enforcement rather than allow the regulations to be developed here on this committee in the House of Representatives and in the Senate, where I think it'd be far better suited rather than at an unaccountable agency where I think there can often be disastrous consequences. Neither Republicans nor Democrats can do anything about it if we feel that the Bureau is overstepping its bounds. And I've made this offer before, and I'm gonna make it again. I'm willing to work with anybody at this committee, regardless of par a party, to do meaningful reform to the structure of the CFPB. I think the Bureau needs to have a leadership structure that respects the principles of our Constitution. I think it needs to be tied to the appropriations process uh, and truly be accountable to the people and to Congress. Consumer protection is vitally important issue, and we should be working together to make sure that the Bureau is lawful, built to protect consumers, and to respond to the concerns of the American people. And so I call on our colleagues to get to work. Now I'd like to chat with you. Director Craninger, I spent some time reading through uh, your budget um, and trying to parse this out. And you were asked earlier by my colleague from Minnesota on your litigation costs. But I think, and I, and I understand you're not, and I'm not asking you to speak to any specific piece of litigation, but trying to just get some clarity into the structure of your budget and going through it, you had about 112 million in fiscal year 2020, about $112 million uh, in what I viewed as salary, $47 million that were in benefits, and 107 million is what were labeled as other contractual services. Unclear if that might be additional litigation expenses. Wondering if you could provide some level of clarity to me and to my colleagues here on this committee as to what your broadly speaking litigation expenses may be across the board. That we certainly can, and we can get back to you on. There are contractual costs associated with litigation, as I was saying, with document productions and sometime data, data analysis efforts, uh, getting depositions and all of those kinds of things involved. 
uh, generally speaking, some contract support. So off the top of my head, I don't have it, but we can we can get back to you on it. I, I think it's an important number, and as you as you go forward and put forward these documents, I think it's helpful to the committee to get a broader understanding of what the the, the the vast majority of the spend is inside the CFPB and what portion of that is in litigation. The reason I'm concerned is I think it's a really poor way to go about policy making when it's done through litigation and enforcement. I think we're far better off at policy making here at this committee through a deliberative process where the people are represented through their elected representatives rather than an unelected agency through litigation. Not a comment to you, a comment really to how this agency was structured, I think, to set up potentially disastrous consequences uh, in the future. Appreciate you coming back with some additional details on the litigation costs. Let me shift gears. I'm also very concerned during the coronavirus, in particular about bad actors in the ongoing pandemic. Uh, the, there are criminals taking this as an opportunity to take advantage of American consumers. And so I've introduced bills to increase penalties on these types of criminals. Can you comment on what the CFPB has done to ensure that consumers of financial products are protected uh, during some of the most challenging of times? Absolutely. We are in a partnership with the Department of Justice, the FTC, all the prudential regulators, state AGs, talking regularly about fraud schemes that we see, who's handling them. Uh, there are certainly a lot of things happening in the healthcare space. Uh, we have seen, uh, admittedly, slightly less on, on the financial product space. And I will say that the financial institutions are, are a huge help in that as well, because they're keeping their eyes out. Consumer advocates are keeping their eyes out. But the minute we hear about anything, we are um, investigating and, and moving out. So that's a, an ongoing um, vigilance, as well as making sure that we get good information to consumers so they are aware of it, so that it's front and center for them. Thank you very much. I appreciate your leadership in this regard, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Riggleman, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you, Director, for being here today. And I'd like to start by thanking you for your continued efforts to make the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau more accountable and transparent and for many actions the Bureau has taken since your appearance in February. I also, going near the end, I get some advantages uh, to being near the end of these. And I'd like to know the challenges that you had. Uh, one of my colleagues talked about the number of complaints that you've had and the increase in those complaints from March until now. And I know you've also had to work under the same structure of CDC guidelines and COVID issues also. Is that correct, ma'am? Uh, yes, we take that seriously. And I would say the challenges have been pretty huge with your workforce, right, for uh, – either, you know, teleworking and things like that. You guys have had to actually sort of navigate all the same challenges that other workforce people have done. Is that correct? Yes, it is. So I think you understand your civic responsibility. And I want to thank you for all those challenges and the amazing number. I know data and I know volume. And the fact that you're getting back to people in nine days, I think is commendable. And there is a difference between receiving the information, and responding to it and doing an investigatory action, which I got to do when I had to process requests for information and intelligence analysis. So I appreciate that. Um, I also want to talk about 1033. And um, I know you announced a tenant issue in ANPR and consumer authorized access to financial records later in the year, and I know we've heard that. So again, the benefit of going later, I don't know if anybody knows how long 1033 is, and I know all of us have probably read it, but 1033 is only 335 words. I don't know if people looked at the section of 1033. And about 10 years ago, it would be the same with me, and I don't know if people had seen three, uh, 1033 and what it's dictating and what you have to do in that rulemaking. There's some challenges. I don't think people really realize. It would like somebody handing me a piece of paper that's 335 words, and it pretty, so, pretty much says, hey, Denver, don't worry. You have a couple of years to make a missile to go between Mach 5 and Mach 25. It has to reentry from space, and it has to hit a target within 10 meters. Go ahead. You can do this. And that's pretty much how many words you have in 1033. So here are some of the challenges I think that CFPB is going to have, and I've been writing these down. I mean, you're really talking about you know, aggregated or interconnected banking. Um, you're talking about a critical path checklist that is huge for 1033 on rulemaking. You're talking about the legal issues people have to deal with, data transfer issues, universal API middleware challenges, data translation, cloud utilization or not, policy and authorizations, interconnected banking like we talked about, and how actually people stress test interconnected banking with that volume of data. Um, you're talking about data volume issues because of that. And then you're talking about access to consumers or aggregators or consumer agents. That's just part of the critical path checklist that you have to worry about during your critical path checklist build when you're making rulemaking. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that is the case. And I'd also say the distinction, though, of course, is that you've got an end user who actually, you know, was building that missile 
This is a distributed system. I am not the builder of this system. And that's why I found it so interesting, the challenges that you have not being the builder of the system, but somehow, you know, being identified as the one responsible for that entire system based on Dodd-Frank and the rulemaking that you worry about on 1033. And I've seen some of the um, talent that you sort of arrayed around you, and I'm really impressed with that. But this is the question I want to get. Do you see the CFPB, even with you not building something, and I would never ask that or never even infer that, do you see yourself almost as a lead, lead system integrator for this? Or do you see when you do this rulemaking that you're just going to have a threshold that these private entities have to actually answer to or build to? Or do you see actually putting out specific rule sets or specific ways of actually approaching this technology? And you are going to be the final arbiter on that. Yeah, you, you have definitely laid out a lot of the challenges of this. I would say that we are really just taking a, a tiptoe in this direction with that advanced notice of proposed rulemaking. We're not necessarily committing to do a rulemaking because there are some who would argue that 1033 and that 335 words is, is self-effectuating. Um, but trying to put some parameters around this and at least have a conversation around these complicated issues is what we're looking to facilitate. Even when you look at Dodd-Frank when it came back over a decade ago, uh, we have gone from things like, you know, relational databases to graph analytic databases and the ability to parse data on a level we've never seen before, right? FinCEN, looking at different types of aggregators all across the financial sector. I think that's why it's such a challenge and why I wanted to just express to you, I appreciate what you've done during the COVID pandemic, but I also hope people understand the challenge of rulemaking at this level with the amount of technology that's sort of presented before the CFPB, but also for those certain banks to actually do this. I think I would love to have seen, if I was here when that was made, I don't see where there's a technical solution for all of this embedded within Dodd-Frank. So I appreciate the efforts that you have. The next question would take 17 minutes to answer, so I'm not going to answer that. So I appreciate your time, and Madam Chairman, I'll yield back my time. Thank you. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Taylor, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Director, appreciate you being here. Madam Chair, appreciate uh, this hearing and this opportunity. I uh, uh, legislatively grew up in the Texas Senate with my colleague from uh, from Texas, Ms. Garcia, and I'm used to a, a perhaps more professional environment where when you're asked a question, you allow the person to answer it rather than cutting them off and then accusing them of refusing to answer. Is there anything you wanted to add? I, I noticed you were cut off a couple of times since I've been here, and I was, maybe there's some question you wanted to answer that I'll just yield you some time to answer a question. Uh, thank you, Congressman. I, I do appreciate that. Uh, I would say we've, we've fulsomely been able to cover some of these things along the way. I know there's a lot of interest, uh, certainly in the qualified mortgage um, effort that, that uh, deserves some more conversation, given it's a proposed rule, though. Um, you know, we have the time for that. We expect to get comments on it. But uh, just noting that the Act requires debt, to, debt and income to be considered and verified. Uh, we believe under a rulemaking there has to be a standard for that that the CFPB would um, would allow to be used. And so that's what we're trying to promote is, is that. That's where the core uh, ability to repay comes into play. Linking that then to the pricing threshold that we're proposing, it really is about a more holistic view than just DTI itself as that ratio uh, that is a hard cap right now um, under the current rule. So, at any rate, there there's there is time on that particular topic to continue the conversation. Thank you for uh, thank you for answering that. And I, it's again frustrating to watch people not have the respect to give you the time to answer the question they're asking. Um, something that's come up repeatedly in this hearing is the recent Supreme Court ruling. I know you've had a chance to think about it, um, and I've had a chance to listen to some of my colleagues and some of your responses. But sort of, if you were to give us a, a what we're supposed to do from here, uh, it seems like we need to change some things in statute. Do you want to speak, could you speak to that? Like what changes would you recommend or what kind of direction should we start go hunting around to, to get the agency in constitutional compliance? So I will tell you, Congressman, I, I the decision with respect to, of course, the removal of the director and the, the president's ability to do that, um, that is the, uh, certainly the, starting point for the conversation. I know that's, for some, the way the organization was created, and then there become some questions about other changes that uh, Congress might want to contemplate. And so I have uh, respectfully declined to opine about precisely what those structure, structural changes or proposals should look like, uh, but I certainly stand ready to, um, you know, provide anything as, as a process goes forward on that. 
uh, that we can provide and, and should something be enacted, um, I'm also obviously stand ready to help implement that. Yeah, I, I certainly hope at a bare minimum that Congress would take action to to you know fix this. Uh, and I guess my, one of my frustrations with this institution is the it's its inability to act um, and to see simple, straightforward legislative solutions go through. Um, that I, I hope we can all agree that your agency should be constitutional uh, and that we would take some actions. And I hope that we could do that on a bipartisan basis. I don't think it's terribly difficult to say, okay. Let's let the president appoint and relieve uh, the director of the CFPB, which I think is my understanding is that would basically bring you in constitutional compliance. Is that directionally correct? Uh, yeah, the decision essentially did that. Um, the question then becomes if there are other changes that the uh, Congress would want to see made. Okay. Um, and so I, I, I look forward to working to try to make this institution functional to actually be able to issue legislation so that it doesn't have to feel like we're so impotent that we must create eight new agencies that are then non, non accountable to, to the institution. Um, I know, again, in my time in the Texas legislature, we were powerful and that we could actually pass common sense legislation. We could bring agencies to heal because we could actually wield legislation. Um, and so when you, that legislature would pass you know, between 1,000 and 1,500 bills per, in a 20 week session, here we're passing about 50 or 100 bills a year. So just the volume of production is just so much lower and therefore the power that it wields is consummate, consequently reduced. Um, and enough of my pontificating on that. Uh, I yield back. Thank you. And so I'd like to thank Director Kraninger for her time today. This may be her last presentation before this committee. So without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions to the chair, which will be forwarded to Director Kraninger for her response. I ask you, Director Kraninger, to please respond as promptly as you're able. And so, um, before we shut down, I have uh, statements for the record without objection. These statements are introduced into the record. All members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. This hearing is adjourned. Thank <laughs> you.